where we um, uh, are communicants in a very uh, marginal Episcopal mission. It's not even a church, it's a mission. Um, and when we're in Canada, I, I function in the United Church of Canada and the Anglican Church. And when I'm here, I'm a Lutheran. Uh, and when we go to live in Mexico, I just pretend I'm a Catholic um, because I functioned in the context of Roman Catholicism for a long time. Uh, and I'm very comfortable. Um, at one time, I knew the, the, the Catholic Mass in Spanish by heart. They've done some revisions, so I have to kind of mumble a few times. Um, that's just kind of the, the, the folks we are. And, of course, the real irony of this whole thing is actually we're Methodists. Um, but I don't go to a Methodist church anywhere. Uh, uh, so that's okay because um, uh, John Wesley was very clear about the fact that uh, the unity of believers is essential with regard to if your heart agrees with my heart, we're brothers and sisters, um, that kind of thing. So uh, why, do I, why, why am I kind of edging into this like a crawdad? Well, I, I'm edging into it because I've been concerned for a long time, uh, for over 30 years, I trained pastors, um, ecumenically, uh, Methodist, and I was, a, I was a dean in a Catholic seminary. Uh, so over the years, I've been training clergy and sitting in pews, and wherever we go, we support some congregation in various ways. And uh, my concern has been the way, what I'm going calling ecumenical Protestant Christianity and I'll just go ahead and name who I'm talking about. I'm talking about American Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, um, United Church of Christ, uh, those folks. We call those the ecumenical Protestants because they always support anything that is of uh, a, a general progressive or traditional uh, understanding. Uh, they're the people who come to meetings of uh, councils and support the National Council of Churches and the World Council. That, those, those are what we call ecumenical Protestants. Every single one of those churches are declining and have been for a long time. I just let that sink in. Um, and if they're not actually declining to the point of death, when you walk into one of them and stand at the back, um, what you're looking at pretty much are cotton tops, right? And you walk, uh, they wanted me to serve a church in Oregon here uh, three or four years ago in retirement, and they had this enormous uh, um, annex, gorgeous two-story annex, uh, 20 classrooms, a gymnasium. Um, I led in the worship service. There wasn't a single person there under the age of 60. The building completely empty. Okay. Uh, one of the joys about this congregation, by the way, is we come here and we see children. I mean, that, that, that's remarkable. But in general, this kind of decline and losing our place with families has had me terribly concerned. So, but I'm, I'm not a church strategist. Um, I, 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 I'm very respectful of my limitations. And my limitations are I'm, uh, although I've been a dean, my teaching has been entirely New Testament and sometimes Old Testament. So the question came to me, what can I, what can I say to the, the core leadership at my church in um, Edmonds, in, in Linwood? What, what can I say that I can, that I can lead with regard to not over um, estimating my knowledge or my ability to say something? And what I came up with is Luke's plot. Uh, in Luke and Acts. And so I'm just going to reveal that right up front, that there, there are some things that this plot, the, how he understands how he got, how we got from point A to point B, the way he understands how that happened is, is so artistic and so well constructed and so informative that it has called the attention of many leaders in many of these denominations I'm talking about. And so I, this is not just something I discovered. Uh, many, many leaders are looking at that whole thing and saying, what can we learn about stopping this decline or somehow becoming willing uh, to deal with the issues the way these leaders dealt with these issues? Okay. Through the guidance of 
the Holy Spirit, by the way, in Luke. So, so as not to be crafty about this, let me tell you what, what, what's going on here in terms of what, what's the nut to crack. Okay, here, here's, here's the nut to crack. And God cracks it. Luke says God cracked the nut for them back then, first century. The nut is, how do you get to a point of embracing change? That's the nut. How do you get there? How do you get to the point of accepting that your ability to keep having a people to share your message with, with is dependent upon how you change, how you're willing to change. Change is easy. It's the willingness to change. That, that's what every leader in all of these denominations is struggling with. So, um, so again, not, not to be crafty, I'm going to start at the beginning by saying here are three things, if you follow this, and, and by the way, we're going to follow it. We're going to follow it text by text by text as you have in front of you. But let me tell you where we're going to come out. If you, if you follow this, you come out with, and this is just not my reasoning, this is just what's obvious, what, what lifts off the page, okay? You come out with three aspects that are very significant. One is that you got to check your enculturated convictions at the door if you want to change. Uh, that's not in the handout. You want what, if you want to make a note on that, that's fine. Okay. You, you, have, you have to check your enculturated convictions at the door. Now, I'm going to show you text by text how that happens for these leaders. As Luke, Luke portrays it, so this um, this is not out of the blue. I'm I'm summarizing what lifts right off the page. That's the first thing that that, that that comes out. The second is you have to experience the other in order to be willing to change your attitude about the other. You have to experience the I, I hate air quotes. Okay, the other. <laughs> You, you have to experience the other if the attitude that is required to change takes place. That, that's what comes out of, these, of this plot. The third is that you have to be tuned into the spirits, the Holy Spirit's nudges, which then have, absolutely have to be processed in a communal setting of reflection. You, this is not for individuals. Oh, I got it. Huh? But, but those, those nudges, well, I mean, what, what, you, what, what the Holy Spirit is nudging you about, what, maybe wakes you up in the middle of the night or causes you to question, well, however you want to ascribe the, those nudges of the Holy Spirit, those have to be processed in a communal context of reflection. Now, those are not my ideas. Those are the three general principles of willingness to change, to get to the mission that is open to others. Huh? That's what comes out of these texts. This. Okay. Now I'm going to pause there because I've kind of laid out um, my, I think last time somebody said, maybe the pastor said, can, can you give us a hint where this is all going? <laughs> I, 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 really, I looked at just the first part of that YouTube thing. So this time I said, I'm going to tell you where I'm going, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you where I'm going to end. Um, so that's kind of what I just did. But any questions just about that? Because I, kn I know I asked you to take notes, so if, you, uh, if I was going too fast, let me know. Anybody got a question about that? Does that make sense to you? Are those three points kind of down? And Yeah, please. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, uh, well the, f the, first, the first one is you have to check your enculturated convictions at the door. Now, by mean enculturated. Let me talk, talk about that. See, we all get raised and socialized by, you know, parents, grandparents, school, church, and that becomes who we are. I mean, we, we think the way we were taught to think, right? So the point is that, that we're, not, we're not in the habit, nobody's ever trained us really 
to check those enculturated convictions. Huh? I'll, I'll, let me pause here and tell you um, uh, a, a kind of a little personal story about this reason this point is comes out of Luke Acts, but it's clear. Let me tell you why. Um, when I became a dean at the Roman Catholic Seminary, and stop me if you've heard this story, this was, this was during the, the Vatican II reform, when a few Catholic seminaries who were modeled after Roman seminaries hired um, experienced Protestant um, administrators to come and show them how to be an American seminary. That, that's, and they were getting accreditation. That, that's, how that, that's how I went there. That, that was my role, is to mod, help modernize a Roman Catholic seminary and get it accredited. So being a, a person who had been you know, in situations where um, ethnic and racial sensitivity was significant, it only took me um, 18 months to look around and say, wait a minute, everybody here is white. Uh, and wait a minute, I'm in the Southwest, and I did a little Wikipedia, and hey, um, do we realize how many millions of Spanish-speaking brown people there are in the Southwest? Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Colorado, where I was located. So I asked a couple of the priests, um, why, 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 aren't we, why, why aren't we doing something about the, the whole... Mexican, Mexican-American thing. I mean, there, there's millions of them around us. They're all, and they're all Catholics. <laughs> and I, get, I got a lot of this. Uh, um, there's a story there. I said, well, I, I don't know the story, but it's well, odd. So then I pick up the news that the, the papal envoy had been whispering in the Pope's ear and said, do you know that there's hundreds of thousands of our children who don't go to church anymore. And, oh gee, did I do that? My, my, wife, my, wife said, my wife said, turn off your damn phone. <laughs> that, if she could, she would. God bless her. I, I'd be lost without her. Um, so, so I heard that, that the Pope had said, I, I, I'm sick of this. And he said to the papal officer, he says, you find one of the, one of the best loved Mexican-American priests, there aren't many, in Texas. And give me his name, I'm going to make him a bishop. So they reached out to a, 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 just an unknown Mexican-American priest in a little impoverished parish and made him bishop. And so I heard about this. So everybody in the whole Southwest is going, what happened? You know, he's not a monsignor in the cathedral. Why? Well, the Pope knew what he was doing. Because, you know, this guy then starts a thing called the Mexican-American Cultural Center under the blessings of the church. So I flew down and interviewed him. And I said, uh, what's going on? He said, well, you're from St. Thomas, right? I said, yeah. I said, uh, well, he said, uh, that's interesting. He said, uh, about 20 years ago, I got kicked out of there for speaking Spanish. I said, oh, so that's the story. He said, yeah, that's the story. He said, but that's not about me and not about that. He said, it's about you and me agreeing that this can change. So I go back and say to the priest, you better check in with the bishops about this. And I'll fast forward and say, I formed an institute in Mexico that I operated, and we began filtering um, students down there for the entire summer and bring them back. I would teach two courses in Mark, one in Spanish, one in English. We began doing Spanish liturgies in chapel. We began putting students with Spanish congregations until we could get to the point where they could function pastorally when they left seminary. Okay. Now, as I was working this through, what they, what they taught me was this. They said, you, you can't just teach white priests Spanish. You had to change their heart. 
So here's what we found. Now, uh, I'm making the point about, about checking your enculturated uh, uh, convictions at the door. So what we found we, we did was that whole, those several summers that we had students in Mexico, we put them to live with working poor Mexicans in their homes. After they'd done that for two or three summers, they'd come back, and one of them changed their last name from Horwitzi huh, to Paz de la Casa. And then we had white priests beginning to ask to be put in poor Mexican parishes because they liked Mexican people better than their own people. <laughs> because they're warm, inviting, forgiving, um, invi I mean, they're just wonderful, heartfelt people, huh? They're, they're in their 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 whole cultural understanding of who the others were out there who somehow spoke Spanish got changed by this encounter huh, of an intimacy, huh? And, and by the way, um, a, a little side story is you know my, my son, who went with me during some of those years, and lived with Mexican families and became uh, fluent in Spanish. In fact, he um, well. Anyway, he, he writes books now. Um, but then he said, well, think, I think my junior year abroad in Spain. And the first telephone call, this isn't Mexico, Dad. <laughs> these, these people are kind of flinty. Uh, I, I'm not having as much fun over here. And by the way, he's going, on Monday, he's going back <laughs> to Salamanca for Rick Steves. But the, the point being, that he discovered, and these priests uh, who in training discovered, that they, they just fell in love with the people. So all of a sudden, what happens? Their whole mission objective in priesthood. I just got an invitation for the 40th um, anniversary of a dear priest uh, who was my student, who, was, who did this. Then he became a missionary in, in Colombia, came back, asked to be in uh, Spanish-speaking parishes in Colorado, uh, and just became one of the most beloved priests in the archdiocese. I mean, th this is just very personal for me. So uh, I, I now I'm, I'm kind of off a little bit, my wife says, on a tangent, but I'm answering your question about, about number one, about number one. So, so, and, and this happens to Peter. This happens to Peter. And he does, but he doesn't start there. Uh, he, has to, he has to be gotten there, okay? So we're thinking about ourselves. I mean, we, I, everybody here was here last time. You're, you're kind of the people who always show up. You're the leaders. That's why I'm doing this. What would it take for Trinity to rethink its mission huh, and be willing to change uh, to the extent of not seeing a decline but a fresh wind come into the congregation? And we all know the issue is a willingness to change enough to be in tune with those others out there. Huh? Not just do good things for them, but to have them a part of our lives. Huh? I'm, I'm being pretty um, direct here, and uh, I hope you understand I'm not doing it as anything but um, a beloved uh, communicant here. So let, let's, let's, let's start to, to work on this, okay? Uh, experience the other in a place where doubts are created about those number one cult enculturated convictions. Experience the other to the extent you begin to have doubts about your enculturated convictions. And then number three? And number three is that, that you take these nudges of the Holy Spirit that are happening in this process and bring them into communal reflection. Communal reflection. Yeah, yeah. This is not like one person getting inspired. Yeah. Uh, just a quick logistical question. I see that we're recording this. Will we be able to get a DVD of this? Yeah, absolutely. It'll be on YouTube, um, as the other oh, one is. Good. Yeah, okay. yeah. We're really happy about that. So let's start. Look, we're going to start. But I want to talk about. Last time I talked about plot. Okay. And I was quoting Aristotle here. Uh, about his idea about you have a beginning and a middle and an end. 
And in that lecture, I pointed out that the reason the four Gospels can have a different portraiture of Jesus is that the end is the same and in agreement, which is the salvific death and resurrection of Jesus. So Jesus can appear many different ways, uh, even in conflict within those four Gospels, but they all agree that the end is the same, the salvific death of Jesus. And um, the middle... Uh, of course, holds apart the end. So, uh, we talked about plot in this sense. This is, uh, this is uh, Aristotle's um, understanding, of course. And his understanding is that when he asks the question uh, in Poetica, what, what controls the plot? He says, clearly, the end. So, er everything is built so that the end becomes uh, a, a credible result of from the beginning through the middle. A credible result. Okay. That's, that's, that's the whole idea of how story works. This is just brilliant. Uh, and it, it, just because it was written by Aristotle doesn't mean it isn't true today. It is. So what about Luke Acts? Well, we have a complication right away because we have volume one and volume two. The Gospel of Luke and the so-called Acts of the Apostles. Okay. So now, how, do, how does this work? Uh, what, what's, what's going on here? How do, we, how do we chart this out? Well, it, it, is, it is much the same, but what's interesting about this is that if you look, if you look at Acts, the end uh, is the universal mission, mission. And by that, I mean the fact that the good news is going out in a very aggressive way and being presented to the entire known world. That's, that's how Acts ends. Huh? So there, we have a revision here because the beginning uh, then asks the question, okay, where is this plot going? Where is this plot going? Well, the middle where have, if we want to do rising action in the middle, we do have what I'm going to put up here as a, as a Cairo symbol, the death and resurrection of Jesus. But the rising plot then does not just simply drop out. It continues and then rises again in Acts. And it, it rises and peaks at chapters 9 and 10. Now, what, what is this? I'm working, this is kind of in a way of, of overview. The essence of the plot, Luke works in both volumes. In Luke, Jesus is born by prophecy, is baptized as a prophet, and then prophesies. And we're going to look at that text where he does that. He utters the pivotal prophecy at the very end, verse chapter 24. We're going to look at that. And then the prophecy is fulfilled in chapters 9 and 10 especially in which suddenly the, universe, the mission of the good news about Jesus doesn't simply expand, it explodes. And the way it explodes is that the object of this mission is no longer limited to Jews. That's what happens. That's his plot. Now that's, that's significant. And what that tells us is that, that that whoever this person Luke was, this magnificent writer, uh, he is looking backwards at what now exists. Huh? And what, what exists when he's writing is hundreds, thousands of worshiping congregations in, through, throughout what we call Palestine, up into Syria, over into what we now call Turkey, all through Turkey, down into, into northern Africa, up on the peninsula to Macedonia, what we call Macedonia and Greece, over into the Italian, okay, over into Spain. That's what he sees. That, that's what has happened. I mean, that, that's, the, that's a phenomenon he's aware of, he knows about. And now what he's doing is he's explaining how it was that this was God's intention and how it came to be. 
how it came to be. That so he's he's looking back, huh? He's not he's not he's not imagining a future when Acts ends. He he knows what exists at that time. I mean, remember now that the the earliest literature we have, which is evidence that there's a, a vigorous church in Macedonia, heck of a long place from Jerusalem, huh? That's being written about 51. 51. I mean, I mean, I'm not going to talk about the dating of Acts, but I mean, we're, we're, couldn't be anything earlier than about 100, huh? 95 to 100. So you see my point? So there's, there's at 51, there's already a vigorous Pauline church in Macedonia called Thessalonica, huh? The first, the first document in the New Testament is First Thessalonians. Huh? It's not number one in order, but that's the first. Huh? And we know that very precisely because of some Roman history. So that's what he's doing, and, and that's his plot. And so now you have a kind of an overview. And I'll pause to see if you have any questions about this as ordered by my wife. <laughs> Don't go too fast, meathead. Is it, uh, did you uh, get that on camera? I'm sorry. <laughs> so any questions about that? It, it's, it's a broad sweeping. Now a couple of words about Luke. He's the most talented Greek writer in the New Testament. Uh, the Greek is flawless. It, um, I'm going to point out occasionally Greek, uh, Greek words that only he uses. In one case, a word that he creates and is only found one other time in Christian literature. Um, his sentences are like textbook. Uh, we study them when we teach um, uh, seminarians uh, Greek. We study Luke's uh, sentence structure. Um, he's a master storyteller. Um, and here's something else he does. He's very, very clever. He writes the, go the gospel we call Luke with an eye on what he's going to write in Acts. So it's not sequential, it's overview. And so he's salting very subtle markers and parallel experiences in Luke that then get utilized in Acts. And then if you're, if you're doing what we call close reading, if you're really paying attention, when you come to those places, you go, oh, oh that guy, that guy. That's clever. How do you do that? Now, one of the ways he do this, and this is one other, just brief introductory thing, uh, and, and it is, it is a remarkable thing. He's go he's going to play with with a word, and I, and I will just put up one Greek word. This is pronounced hodos. And this, this, this word is kind of one of those general words, but it, it's, it's either, it, it could mean something like a road, okay? But the way, the way Luke uses it is, it's a way. The way. So much so, here, here's what happens. It can also mean a journey. When, when you compare Luke with Mark, Here's how he organizes his gospel. In chapter 9, already, in, in the gospel, Jesus begins a journey. And the journey goes all the way to the entry to Jerusalem. In other words, the three-fourths of the gospel is a journey story, a way story. Now, on, on this journey, some things happen that kind of trip, and I'm going to show you a text this notion of, of way or journey. The Samaritan, who acts differently than the first two religious persons, it's, Luke has him on the way, capital W, as an anticipation of Luke. It's, it's very clever. Then, when we get to, to, to Acts, Paul, when he's struck from his horse, is on the way. And then in the next chapter, when the emissaries are sent from Cornelius to bring Peter to preach to a house full of Gentiles, <coughs> the emissaries are on the way. 
And then throughout Acts, the word church doesn't occur often. Rather, it's what, what's happening, this mission, this gathering, these people who now we learn in Acts are called Christians. This is described as the way. So this is, this, this is just how clever he is. He constantly is talking about way, 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 journey, journey, journey. Now, uh, stand back. Now, that's, that's, that's the forest. Stand back and look at the trees. What does that say? Luke is, is, is subtly suggesting that how, how the church emerged to finally be obedient to God's understanding was a journey. What does that teach us? It, it means you don't, if you're concerned about being in God's way <laughs> in order to be more obedient, that's not, that's not something that happens at a, a tent meeting with a 10-minute prayer. It's a journey. So e this thing I'm talking about, how do you come to the point of being willing to change? It's a journey, not a one-time conversion. You see, that, that's what Paul is, that, that's what Luke is saying. Life, this life of obedience is a journey. Get, getting on the way is more important than saying, constantly saying, are we there yet? <laughs> you get the idea? I mean, you, you, you don't say, are we there yet? You, you are, what's important is like the Samaritan, being on the way. And by the way, because that word is so odd in that story, I'll show you how it gets translated differently. Okay, your first, is your first handout Luke 4, 19 through 29? Uh, the, uh, it should be number one, is that right? Okay, so that's just the NRSV translation, not my own. And um, it, is, it is extremely significant. And I'll tell you why. In, in, Luke here is following Mark. Mark has a, about a one-paragraph little story about this visit to his hometown synagogue. Well after Jesus is not only been working, but already in trouble. Huh? Luke moves this story to be the first event. Now that, that alone is significant. But then what he does is, instead of just saying, well, he stood up and then everybody said, well, where did he get all of this stuff? Isn't he just the son of the carpenter? Which is, and they didn't believe. That's how, that's how Mark tells it. Well, instead of that, Luke cleverly works out a sermon text for Jesus, writes it for him, and then writes him a sermon. That's what happens here. So now we have Jesus in the hometown synagogue being given a, a, a doctored text and then being given by Luke a sermon. Now this, this is, think of it this way. So now, why does he do that? What's, what's, what's in that text and what's in that sermon that gets Luke started on this plot? That's the question you have to ask. Huh? Well, let's look at it. And I won't read the whole thing, but you look at verse 18 where you have the bold print. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Aha, now we start the theme that the, this this presence and work of the Holy Spirit, which is why I gave you point number three, is, Luke says, is an absolutely essential element in this journey and in the fulfillment of prophecy. So now Luke is the gospel, and Luke acts, the texts of the Holy Spirit. That's unique. <coughs> That's unique. Now, here's a little side story. The whole phenomenon in American religious life that is perhaps of the greatest significance in the 20th century was, was not Billy Graham, and bless his soul, but in fact Pentecostalism, uh, which became, uh, and, and you, you don't know how powerful this is, and, and, and here's a little aside. One, one, one of the reasons I'm pointing this out is that, that the, the Pentecostal or the, 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 and I'm just using that as a small p, not a denomination, but the whole idea of 
the role of the Spirit in the life of believers that was recovered in California by a particular black uh, pastor huh, became a, a phenomenon that changed the entire face of Christianity in Latin America and does today. And by the way, are some of the churches that are not simply full, but full to the brim and growing um, amongst us. Huh? So that dis how, how did it happen? They discovered Acts. And they, 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 they became aware of the importance of the role of the Spirit in the work of evangelization and the evangelization of people in the church. Huh? So Luke starts his whole plot of the Spirit right here. Because uh, remember that this is not something that, that Luke says about Jesus. He's already said that because the story before this is the baptism of Jesus where the Spirit descends upon him. Then the next thing, he stands up and says, the Spirit is upon me. That, that's unique. That's, that's only Luke. So everything he does now it, he does through the Holy Spirit, and what he does is to prophesy. So in Luke's gospel, Jesus is a prophet. He's the only, go the only gospel where the chief, the chief <laughs> characteristic of Jesus is he's a prophet. And this all works because what he's prophesying is something that unfolds here in Acts and his death. Okay, let's, let's go. So, so then he, he reads um, the scroll. But it, it's a made-up text. It's made from a couple of verses in Isaiah 61 and 58. But it's, 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 a, uh, uh, it, it's the place in the Old Testament where finally we begin to get hints uh, that, that God's salvation is for all nations. Huh? So that's why it's significantly from Isaiah. Huh? So that's the text. Then he sits down. And everybody looks at him, and he stands up, and now he gives a sermon based on that text. And he said, well, why, why, are, you, why are you doubting? Well, I know why you're doubting. You're doubting because you're going to say, well, um, heal yourself. Or, or you, because we know that um, prophet is never honored in the prophet's own country. We know that from Jewish history, he says. Then he goes on, and he says, now, if you look at verse 25, and look at the third word, but the truth is, he is now speaking truth. There were many widows in Israel at the time of Elijah in heaven. Okay, then he tells the story in brief of the widow of Zarathah. Then he goes on and tells the story about Elisha. Now, these are stories found in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And then he doesn't, draw the, uh, the, the conclusion because uh, in, you won't find the word here. This is, this is Luke's cleverness. Who, who were these people, the widows are, in terms of ethnic identity and Nam and the leper? Who were they? Non-Jews, Gentiles. So he, you have to know that because Luke doesn't have Jesus tell you that because he's being subtle. So this is a hint. And then now what happens? Look at verse 28. When they heard this, all the synagogue were filled with rage. And that word rage in Greek is just vivid. huh? So they're filled with rage. Why? Why? And, and then they go out. Then they, they, they pick him up, take him out to a Brava hill, and want to kill him. Now, I, I used to say to my, my seminary students, how do you know you're a really effective preacher? Okay, first time you preach in a new congregation, they want to kill you, you're doing good. Yeah, don't, don't be mommy pomby yeah, make, make, you know, sit people's teeth on edge right away so they know you're going to be a prophet in your midst. Well, yeah, do that, and then you're going to be gone. Um, so why, why, why would they try to kill him? Why would they try to kill him? This, is, this, is, this really challenges the credibility. Well, it's, Luke is saying, this is what's going to happen again and again and again when in the context of Israel, you say, the salvation God's been working is not just for us, it's for everyone. So this becomes a theme in Acts. Every time after chapter 10, they start to preach to the Gentiles, 
they get thrown in jail and people try to kill them. You see how Luke is anticipating this in the very first story? It's very clever. It's, it's what we call a thematic unity. What Jesus is saying, this is the way this is going to be uh, from, from this point on. And so what he is saying when he reads, he's saying, what I meant by reading these texts from Isaiah is, I'm here to announce under the authority of the Holy Spirit that God is bringing salvation to all peoples. Now that, that ought to send a little bit of a shiver up your back because that is utterly, utterly unique and so incredibly bold huh? and beautiful, literarily beautiful. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Uh, but, but that, yeah, please, please. But we still are doing this, but not necessarily only ethnic. No. We are, we are feel, getting filled with rage. Yes. Uh, when certain people yes. are being welcomed. Into the exactly, and I think what, what Luke is cleverly saying here, expect rage. Thank you for nodding your head. Yes. <laughs> Expect rage. And, and Peter, Paul, Barnabas, Silas, they all get rage. Enormous rage. Huh. Expect rage. Are you willing to expect rage? Huh. That's, Jesus is saying, that's the challenge of changing. Go to your second one. Uh, Luke 5, 1 through 11. Um, and I want to I, I warn you, um, I do in the footnote number one that um, I, 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 I don't want this translation used anywhere else. I'm, do, I'm having a lot of fun with it, and it's, I, I describe it as an assisted translation. So I do want to read it aloud because I think this one, this is absolutely crucial for what we're trying to do here in this uh, seminar. So here's the way the story goes. And by the way, what we just looked at was, was chapter 4. This is chapter 5. This, this is what happens next. So, so Luke's not dumb. Huh? We have this prophecy and this rage, and now he's going to go out and enlist the people who are going to carry out the prophecy upon whom the Spirit is going to lead huh, and rest. The very next thing to happen after the conflict-rich appearance and preaching in his hometown synagogue in Nazareth was this. A crowd appeared and surged around him right there on the beachfront of Lake Gennesaret, down by the edge of the water, just to hear him talk about the word of the Lord. And looking around, he saw two fishing boats beached on the shore. Now, the folks who owned these fishing boats, purse sailors, were working on their nets. Without a word, he climbed into the boat the boat happened to be the boats happened to belong to Simon and ordered him to launch the boat out just a little ways into the lake. He then sat down in the prow of the boat, <clears throat> faced the crowd <clears throat> on the beach, and commenced to go on with his teaching. And when he finished speaking to the crowd, he turned to Simon and said, "Go ahead with your boat right out there in the deepest part of the lake, and then set out your nets for a big catch." And Simon comes right back. Uh, well, Sensei, we have been out the whole night long, working ourselves silly. We brought back an empty boat. Didn't catch nada. Still, given your word, we'll go ahead and launch out. Having done so, they brought in a gazillion fish. So many, in fact, they worried about the nets giving way under the weight of the catch. To save the catch, they signaled for help from the other purse saner that had gone out with Simon. The other boat came to help them with the haul. You see, if they had brought the purse saner nets into just Simon's boat, the catch would probably have sunk the boat. Seeing all this unfold, Simon Peter plopped right down in front of Jesus and said, You better stay away from me. I'm a long way off from anything you'd call righteous, Your Holiness. You see, he was scared stiff and trembling, in fact, just like all the other mariners working with him all because of the big catch they had all helped bring in. And some of those mariners included the Zebedee brothers, James and John, who were at that time in a partnership with Simon. In response to their reaction, Jesus turns to Simon, and only him, 
and says, have no fear. Starting today and for the rest of your life, you are going to fill to the bursting nets brought in with all kinds of live souls. And then the boats were back up on the beach and the mariners got out and without a backward glance took off after him. Now why do I translate this way? Okay, um, you notice in the fifth line down, happens belong to Simon. That's what we call a divine passive. In other words, it, it, often in storytelling, especially in Hebrew context where you're being sensitive, instead of naming God, you, you say, you indicate God by something happened, something was caused to happen. So we're, Luke wants us to understand, it's not just happenstance that that boat is there <laughs> and that it belongs to Simon. That's part of the divine plan. That's why I translated to lift that out as being clear. Now, when in the, in the uh, italicized first um, uh, statement of Jesus, go ahead with your boat right out into the deepest part, the uh, reason I did deepest part of the lake is he says bathos. Now, uh, down below I point out that, uh, look at number three in the, in the footnote. Uh, Peter is really out of his depth. Luke knows what he's doing. This double meaning has ironic humor. Uh, Peter, Peter, once Peter agrees to go out, he is out of his depth. And he doesn't know what the bottom of that depth is until chapter 10 in Acts. Now this, this, is, this is, and by the way, don't, don't kid yourself. Are you looking too deeply here? No, not, not with a writer like Luke. He doesn't, he doesn't use words like bathos without knowing what he's doing. And why, why would he have to say to the deepest part of the lake? He's a fisherman. He knows where to go. But then uh, I do this thing is a little playful where Simon comes right back and says, uh, well, and that's the way the Greek sentence looks. And I, and I translate the word uh, epistata in Greek as sensei. Now, why do I do that? And I explain that in, in footnote number two. But I want to point out that, that the word sensei is pretty well known in North America because of karate, right? And that's because this is only Luke uses this word. And, and he, uses it, he uses it twice, and it's always in Peter's mouth. So Peter calls Jesus sensei or epistata. Now, this is a common word in, in Hellenistic culture. If you look at your gigantic Greek lexicon, it comes up all the time, and it's used, um, for instance, uh, of the master of a gymnasium in, in Roman Hellenistic culture. See, you took the cream of your youth and put them into these gymnasia. And by gymnasia is meant life training. You're, you're training them to be loyal Roman functionaries or soldiers or leaders or whatever. It's very much like sending, like the British used to send um, their children to Eton. And it's, it's, it's just that kind of thing, because the headmaster becomes legendary, huh? I mean, you, you, what you eat for breakfast and how many inches of the chair you occupy is the headmaster's choice, huh? Right? And when the light goes off is the headmaster's choice. Okay, that, that's what sensei means, or a military commander. Now, again, Luke here knows what he's doing. So, Pete, right away, Peter knows better, watch this, he knows better that fishing won't work because of his enculturated knowledge about fishing. Then we get a but, and it is in Greek, a but. But, sensei, at that moment, something happens. That, that something happens. What happens? Peter becomes an open-hearted learner. That, this is the school of Peter. This is the first step in the school of Peter. He becomes a learner with the word sensei. I know better. I know how to do this. You're not a fisherman. I've been out there all night long. I know the fish are. This is how I make a living. But, master, I'll do it. And the result is, a massive, that's why I translate 
correctly per seiner. Uh, because people get the wrong idea about, if, if you don't know fishing, and a lot of you do here in the Pacific Northwest, but a purse is, is is a multiple boat operation. It's a partnership of two boats pulling big nets. Huh. So these are big nets. This is, this is commercial fishing. And by the way, uh, Gennesaret was the source of most of the protein uh, for working folks in that time. What I'm, at Magdala, there was a huge, we know now, a fish ladder, a drying rack, kind of like in Norway with cod, exactly like that. So these persainers were harvesting planted stock. These, the, the fish they're, they're going after are planted from Egypt. It's like tilapia. So th this is a commercial venture. They are, they're out there bringing in hauls of fish when things go well, selling them to the fish racks at Magdala. And then this salted fish, so what you would eat, you'd have a lot of grain, some fruit, and then on top of the grain, a little bit like, like uh, poor Japanese food, you have, you have a, a, a maybe a, a two-ounce piece of salted fish. That, that, that's your protein. So this, this, is, this is about working people. Huh. Quite different than Mark. In Mark, Peter is a, an amphibious fisherman. He stands uh, up to his thighs and throws a little net. And James and John have a fleet. Luke changes all this for his own reasons. Huh? This is not historic. This is all literary. He, he wants the three of them to participate in the hall because the three of them are going to have to make the decision that the good news is open to the Gentiles. The three of them. Peter, James, and John. This is how this works in Acts. So nothing here is accidental. This is all programmatic in terms of the future. What else? Um, well, the final statement, and here um, I'm, I'm talking about, um, let's see in my notes. Um, well, let's read my note in note two at the bottom. Uh, about five lines down, the sentence beginning, this makes the plot, i read that, this makes the plot of Acts work not Peter's divinely granted authority, as in Matthew's gospel, were it not for Peter's willingness to obey in spite of his presumed better notions, the gospel would not have resulted in the Ro a Roman world full of Gentile believers. Luke's storytelling plan calls for Peter not to understand at this time there are theological reasons for this as well as artistic reasons. Peter is entirely believable as a reluctant learner. Theologically, Luke wants to affirm that the world mission as it stands was God's plan, not Peter's. Peter's story portrays the unfolding of God's intention to break nets step by step, not in a dramatic revelation on a mountaintop in which everyone, including Peter, was on board from the get-go. So, why do I translate at the end? Um, of that uh, one, two lines up from the bottom of the translated text. Starting from today and for the rest of your life, you are going to fill to the bursting necks brought in with all kinds of live souls. Now, the word there is very interesting. It's, it's very rare. It's, it show, it, Luke is showing off his vocabulary. The Greek word is uh, uh, zogron, zogron. Zogron is used throughout Hellenistic literature. A zogron is any kind of gathered produce. It could be um, a stall of melons uh, in, in a market. It could be a herd of cattle. It could be a, a sheep, uh, and occasionally of people. So why, why in the word, the word begins with zo, the word for lo, like zoology. So, so that's why live souls. So he's saying you're going to bring in a nets full to the bursting of live souls. This is a prophecy of the fullness of the Gentile mission that Luke knows has happened. And he puts it backward as a prophecy to Peter. Now, Peter doesn't get it. He can't get it. Because if he got it, it would be Matthew's gospel. And it's not Matthew's gospel. But in Luke, he, he can't get it yet. He's, he's got to discover it on his journey. 
And the journey's going to have a lot of ups and downs. Don't you worry. Lots. Okay, let's go to the third handout. And I see here I've got to... Um, this is a, a Samaritan seed planted. Okay. This is... This is, this is quite uh, a remarkable text because Luke, Luke tells, is, is the place where we find the best known and the most utilized um, parables of any of the New Testament. Uh, down in Oregon, there's a huge system started by the Episcopal Church, to their credit, that has a hospital in virtually every community in, in, in um, the middle part of the valley and on the coast called the Samaritan system. <laughs> and you know about the good Samaritans. So, I mean, this, is, this has been um, a, a really important problem. It, it is used in a kind of, I would call, surface way of giving help. Huh? But again, the way Luke tells the story, it's a part of his plot, not, not just about who is your neighbor, but in addition to that, contributing to the plot. Uh, not the, not it's unimportant about being a good Samaritan. That, that's not the point. But the point is to see how it's also part of the plot. And it is in very interesting ways. Well, if you, if you look at the bold print, I'll go right to that. But a Samaritan while traveling, now, the NRSV travel, uh, 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 that, that is the, the NRSV uh, translation. But if you look down at my notes and, and look, look up from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six lines, okay, and it begins with the word this. This means hoduon might be translated making his way instead of the NRSV while traveling. Luke appears to present the Samaritan as already a follower of the way, even though the good news has not yet been preached to the Samaritans. But will be. Because one of the things that happens before chapter 9 is the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, a black man from uh, Egypt, and a village of Samaritans. So it's kind of a gradual thing. Now we got Samaritans. They, uh, finally, they agree. Okay, the Spirit says, okay, the Samaritans are included. And then the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, there's, a, there's a Spirit command to go talk to the eunuch who's reading Isaiah again. He gets converted. Huh? So the Samaritan story here is kind of uh, an anticipation of the fact that Samaritans will be included. Huh? But more importantly is this thing of in the way. Now, I think the time has come for me to actually read some of these texts about the way. And I'll just do that for you because I think it's pretty darn um, important at this point. Um, and these are all, in, of course, in Acts. Okay. One of, the, one of the, the most important ones is in Acts 16, 9 through 10. And this is um, a story about, the, you remember the Macedonian call uh, 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 that Paul receives? And the story uh, it takes up here at verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing beseeching him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he had seen the vision, immediately he sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So there, there is the call. Then in Acts 24, we get a vivid use of this way uh, information. 24, 14 through 22. But this is Paul before Phoenix on trial. Uh, 
here's what Paul says, but this I admit to you that according to the way, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law or written in the prophets. Okay. Then, let's keep going here. Uh, in your handout, there are some other texts I want to look at. Uh, 9-2, Acts 9-2. This is one I've referred to before. This is about Paul's Damascus journey. Now, as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now, as he journeyed, th that, that language is... Uh, went along his way. Now since we're, since we're there, uh, cast your eye just above that at chapter 8, verse 36, the story of the uh, eunuch and Philip. Verse 36 reads, And they went along the way. And that's very clever because what happens is as they go along their way, and the gospel has already been preached to the to eunuch, they come to standing water. So on the way, they get to baptism, and then the eunuch is baptized. That's another big breakthrough. Well, let's uh, look at a couple other texts. Um, 9 to 18, 25. 18, 25 and 26. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Though he knew only the baptism of John, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when the Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and expounded to him the way, the way of God more accurately. There you have it, way again. So I think that's enough. It's just, it's all over the place. And again, it's one of the ways that Luke keeps reminding us that, that, well, let me, let me back up. You know what happens in Matthew. You have the resurrection, and then Jesus appears to them, not in Jerusalem, but in Galilee on a mountaintop. And he says, go out now and preach and teach everything I've told you and baptize those of all nations. Huh? And then the gospel ends, and, and you believe it. You, you believe they did what they were told to do in that one momentous post death resurrection speech that's it in fact the seminar the catholic seminary i taught it had that text inscribed in stone above the chapel door <laughs> and we've seen it all over the place go ye into all the world and preach the gospel right i mean there are some missionary societies founded on that that's matthew but it's 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 not credible because people simply don't get a command and go out and then convert the whole world it it just doesn't happen Luke's story is credible, and it's credible because Peter is a learner, but he learns in increments, and further, he does it on a journey that's fraught with danger and mistakes. Mistakes are made, and we're going to come to that in just a minute. Oh, anything else on here I think um, is more about the interpretation of the parable uh, than not, but I do want to point out that the Samaritan also, if you look at the bold print, about three-fourths of the way down on the Greek, there's a B in brackets, and then that line reads uh, Samaritites, the Samaritan, but the Samaritan, and then Tis is who, and then we have this interesting use of a participial form of the word road or journey, who was roading, who was in the way, Eothen came, Kat is two, Auton is he, and then we have another participle, this is typical of Luke, a series of participles, then we have a verb, uh, Edon, seeing, and the next word is this really difficult word in Greek, which means was deeply moved to compassion. So the first two, see and go to the other side of the road. See, go to the other side of the road. The Samaritan, Sees is filled with compassion. Because why? And this is what is not usually brought out in these interpretations. 
The reason he's moved to compassion is because he's on the way. He's on the way. So uh, he, he becomes a hero figure, uh, actually a model for the evangelists and deacons and apostles in Acts to act. This is how you are to act. Be on the way and seeing have compassion. And that's what happened in Acts. We get, we get uh, jailers saved from, from death. Or we get uh, people who are healed, uh, people who are, who are desperately ill healed. Uh, we, we get all of these acts of compassion that rise out of being on the way. So this is another theme of Luke that this whole thing of coming into congruence with God's plan has as an aspect to it the necessity of feeling compassion. Not just seeing, because when you just see, you say, oh, that's too bad. But when you're on the way, you experience compassion. Now, let me pause here, okay, because we're talking about how do we come to the point of having the attitude that it takes to endure the pain of change with regard to enculturated convictions. Uh, how, do, how do we do that? Well, you read the newspaper, you watch the news, it, it just it's all replete with things that make you go, oh man, that's horrible. Oh, that's, that's too bad. Oh, shall we write a check for that? I mean, it's us. I'm not, I'm not making fun of this. I'm saying that, that's, that's me. It's us. I think we should send some money to them. Okay. What happens when you're on the way is you don't just respond with pity and sending a check. You respond with deep felt compassion. Now, deep felt compassion will, will cause you to get in trouble. And, and here, because in, in handout, you'll see the references. This word, Luke looks, looks, knows what he's doing. This word is only use of Jesus in response to human need. Except here. What he's saying is, this Samaritan, on the way, understands what it is to see trouble Trouble people with compassion. That, I'm, I'm, I'm pausing here because this is really, this is really significant, huh? You, you just, it's not just feeling pity or saying we should do something for those people, which is fine. That's, that's good. I mean, uh, the way uh, Americans in general respond by sending millions of dollars to earthquake, earthquake victims, ab absolutely fine. That's not what this is about. This is about how the church gets itself into the mode of acting like Jesus seen through the eyes and actions of the Samaritan. That, that's what this is about. And it's not isolated, I'll repeat the point, because this now, now, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, this is how deacons and evangelists and apostles work in Acts. They get it, finally. Oh, that's... Okay, that's enough. All right. Um, then let's go on to the next handout. Number four. I'm going pretty fast. I'm going to take a break in a minute because uh, we are going awfully fast. This is really interesting stuff. Okay. Here, here's, here's, part, here's part of Peter's education. Okay. And that's what we're talking about. Okay, so he's, he declares himself to be a learner. Let's see how he's doing. By the time we get into what this is, is just before the journey narrative starts. So at, the, at, at kind of his apprenticeship stage, when he's, he was about ready to launch on the way, but he's not there yet, how does he respond? Uh, this is my own translation, so I'll, 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 I'll read it. On the eighth day, after having spoken these words, predicting his own death, and in order to pray, Jesus climbed up to a mountaintop, taking with him Peter, James, and John. Those are the partner, the fishing partners. And then it happened that while in the midst of his prayers, his face was altered, 
and his clothing took on a brilliant flashing white. And lo and behold, two other figures appeared conversing with him. It was Moses and Elijah. Their appearance took on a magnificent radiance as they conversed with him concerning the final events that were to unfold in Jerusalem. And now Peter and those with him, who had been in a deep, almost hypnotic sleep, awoke to see his radiance and the two figures there with him. And then the two slip, split off, taking their leave of him. And Peter says to Jesus, Sensei, how wonderful for us to be here. What say we make three shrines, one each for thou, Moses, and Elijah? Parentheses. You see, Peter was overwhelmed and really didn't know what to say. And as he was speaking, a nebula rolled right over, right over them and enveloped them. The three were terrified, having been completely engulfed by the nebula. And then out of this nebula, there came a voice saying, This is my son, the chosen one. Hear him. And as soon as the thing with the voice was finished, Jesus was seen to be by himself. And as for his disciples, not one word was spoken among them, nor did they spread abroad what they had experienced. Okay, some points about the translation. That parentheses there about, you see Peter was overwhelmed, that's not mine. That's in the Greek text. And it appears literally like a parenthesis because it's the writer uh, actually commenting on um, what Peter says, what, 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 well, what the writer has Peter say, <laughs> which he gets from Mark, by the way. Now, in, in the New Testament Gospels, we almost never are giving, given what uh, literary criticism calls internal view of characters. It almost never happens. Like, like in modern novels, they'll go on sometimes for a couple of pages telling you what people are thinking or feeling, you know, that kind of thing. In first person sometimes, in third person. Almost never happens. So when, when, when Luke goes inside Peter's head and tells you what's going on, that's not for fun. That, that, that's purposeful. Okay. So that's, that's why it's really important to mark that and why I put it in parentheses. In other words, what, what, what is Luke saying? He knows to say sensei. He gets it because he, he learned the first time. Huh? So now he's guessing. What would sensei want me huh, to say or do? Huh? What, what, what? And he comes up, well, uh, do something religious. Uh, build, build, build shrines. That, that, uh, my hair, that'd be great. Then we can come and we can tell the story, and people will go to their knees and say, "Oh, isn't it wonderful?" And no. So, so Luke has him say he didn't know what he was talking about. This, this is not about building shrines. Huh? So you may ask the question: Well, what does Luke think it's about? Well. You can tell by the way he changes Mark, which is he's conferring with the two other greatest prophets in Israel, Moses and Elijah, who are the premium prophets. As a prophet, about what he knows is being prophesied that's going to happen in Jerusalem. Now, you're going to think, and by the way, everything from now on takes place in Jerusalem that's important. That's in complete contrast. In, in Matthew, it's Galilee. In Mark, it's Galilee. Uh, in John, it's somewhere else we don't know, but it's certainly not Jerusalem. Okay. So, are you thinking death and resurrection? Yeah, that's right. But that's not the only thing that happens in Jerusalem that's being prophesied. What, what happens in Jerusalem after this is the ascension. And before the ascension, Jesus prophesies that they're going to go into Jerusalem and Judea and the uttermost parts of the world and preach to all ethne, people, all peoples. Now, ethne can be translated people or Gentiles. The word means both in the New Testament. That's what's going to happen in Jerusalem. So it, it's a prophecy of the future, huh? 
But Peter doesn't get it yet, obviously, huh? because he's thinking the way he thinks a, 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 a divine-like figure like Jesus, how would he want to be responded to? Build him a shrine. That's what we do. That's what we do. I'm not going to draw any... I'm not going to draw any lines for you here. <laughs> um, do we ever do that? <laughs> you, you, you get me, right? Yeah, okay. Not that I don't like shrines. Um, now, why do I translate my, pe my wife who proofreads? said, uh, why, why do you use the word nebula? I said, well, uh, because that's the word in Greek, and there's another reason why I do that, is because you'll notice that in, uh, I put at the title, not a transfiguration. In Mark, th there's a word used of what happens to Jesus, and it's metamorphous, like a caterpillar. Huh? That word does not occur in Luke. This is not a metamorphosis. But rather, it's, a, it's an apocalyptic-like event. Now, now, what do I mean by apocalyptic? Now, be, be careful here. I don't mean crashing uh, armies. What I mean by apocalyptic is, that I talked about this at the last time, you have this notion of this other world and this world, and sometimes you get Congress between those two, because that's semi-permanent. You know this, right? That's the kind of experience, because... Moses and Elijah come, come down, penetrate the other world into this world, and Jesus is up on a mountaintop meeting them. And what happens is the kind of things that happens in these apocalyptic stories. There's conferral beyond this world. And they, be, why? Because knowledge, there's knowledge that goes beyond anything available in this world. That, that's what's happening here. So the nebula thing conveys more than a cloud, huh? The kind of thing. Now, if you think I'm guessing here, I'm actually not, because let me read for you um, Exodus 40:35. This is Moses. Then the nebula covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, if you look at note number one, I say all of the bold-faced words in the Septuagint text of Exodus 40:35, which I just read to you in English, appear in Luke's account of the transfiguration. Let's count them. Look at the next line. Moses, one. Tabernacle, or tent, two. Covered, three. Uh, nebula, four. Glory, five. Uh, and tent. So, five words that occur in the Greek translation of Exodus 40:35, or is it 35:40? What did I say? 40:35. Five of those words occur in the the description of what happens to Jesus in this event. You think that's an accident? No. People, because Luke knows his he knows his Septuagint by heart. Don't don't kid yourself. So he's saying here, this is like what happens when, and by the word, the, the way the, the word Lord here in, in Exodus is not Lord, it's all caps Lord, it's Yahweh. Huh? This, this is, you can't go in when Yahweh is present because you're going to see the full dimension of Yahweh's glory, hmm? Shekinah glory. Huh? That's, that, you can't do it. That, that's, that's, you're going to get burned up or blinded or something, huh? So what, what Peter is observing here is a revelation like that to Moses uh, in terms of the tabernacle in Exodus. That, that's absolutely remarkable stuff. It's a massive change in Luke's uh, revision of this story, and he does it for a reason. Look at, look at, look at um, uh, number two in my notes. Peter's role is emphasized by Luke when compared with Mark's version by way of a narrator's revelation of Peter's uh, inner process. I've talked about that. Then the final sentence, Bo both Peter and Paul in Acts will have similar experiences. Being obedient to those revelations is pivotal for changes resulting in evangelizing strategies. 
Then look at point number uh, three. I'm going to read that as well. This event is left hanging in, sev in several ways. The reference to things that must happen in Jerusalem may well go beyond passion and resurrection appearances. Well, I've already kind of covered that. Let's go to four. Commands from Jesus concerning the world mission, including Gentiles, are not used by Luke to effect the radical change of attitude on the part of Peter and the apostles and Paul regarding whether or not the good news was to be offered to Gentiles. It will take visions to do the job. Luke prepares for the final revelation of God's salvific plan as it unfolds in Acts by retelling Mark's story of the transfiguration as a retrospective of the Elijah and Moses stories of otherworldly interventions. And skip that down and go down to the bottom line. At this, uh, th this term, uh, this, no, second line from the bottom. The word orama in Greek, horama, or vision, is not used in this story, but is crucial to the otherworldly encounters in Acts. And here I list them. Uh, and you can make a little note if you want to. The first one, Acts 10, 17, and 19, are Peter's experience, described as a vision. And then uh, 16, 9 following is Paul's vision and the Macedonia call. And then Exodus 3, and I think I'm going to read that one uh, because that is, that's pretty jarring. Uh, that, that's, that draws, again, a line between Moses and and uh, what's happening here, not just to uh, Peter, but eventually to Paul. Um, it reads this way. Uh, this is the burning bush story, uh, Exodus 3.3. 3. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Now that great sight, I did check out uh, in the Greek translation, and it reads, Opsomai uh, to horama mega. So, Horama Megna is actually translated here as a great sight, this great vision. So, vision, 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 vision. So, vision becomes a, uh, uh, a means in Luke's writing to enable uh, human beings to get a glimpse. Now, let, let's, let me translate that in terms of what I'm saying about how we get about change. <clears throat> um, Got to be careful here, because we have learned to be suspicious. So people woke up and said, um, I had a visit in the middle of the night from Jesus, and he told me, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we should be suspicious, okay? However, if we take the word vision, huh? Uh, after all, Luke is writing in a context where, where the way people rise beyond the known is to, is to have their imagination inflamed by some force that takes them above, that takes them above. You, you see what I'm saying? That, that's, that's the mechanics of what we're talking about. Okay, now, now for us, what are the mechanics of rising above what is known? and familiar, and getting a perspective. Huh? What, what, what are the mechanics? That, that's for us to seek out. But it's not different from, from some of the things that um, I was talking about as the practical threefold consequences of this whole plot. So let me pause here and tell you a, um, a story I think that kind of illustrates uh, that just um, a little bit. Uh, along with, with my, my role as often a dean in different uh, denominational seminaries, uh, one of the things I, I, I did until from the, almost the beginning to the very end was to encourage cross-cultural study. And that's, I did that for Protestants and Catholics alike and developed an institute down in Mexico. And so eventually the AATS at accredited schools said, well, it's not exactly a requirement, but every seminary should have a, a carefully designed, supervised experience of cross-cultural study. And um, I was very heavily involved in that movement for a long time and active in it. And so let me tell you about what, why we would do that uh, and why we did it. We, we didn't do it so people would become competent uh, 
pastors in other cultures because that takes a whole lot more than a cross-cultural experience that's well supervised. Here's why we did it. And we explain this again and again in our catalogs and to students who are taking this. And a lot of students complained about it, did not want to do it, were not interested, tried to get out of it. Okay. Here's, here's why we did it. We did it because it's very hard to get perspective on pastoral issues that demand strategy. It's very, where do you get perspective? You, you, you have been trained and raised to basically have one perspective. Now, if we can, if we can invest you to a, a, a fulcrum point, the carefully designed, where your anxiety is raised a little bit about what you think you know, but not so much as to throw you into crisis. In other words, culture shock. If we can just, you need a little anxiety. If we, if we can get that anxiety up to, to a certain point and sustain it and then deal with it, you may come to the point of saying, I think I'm beginning to see these things in a different way. And that's the value because we need pastors who can put perspective on things beyond the one they were born with, raised with, huh? kind of a thing. And I'll tell you a very, a very interesting story. Um, after many years of taking students, on one occasion, uh, uh, this happened to be a group of, um, of Protestant students. And uh, we had a very well-designed program in connection with a, a Mexican university. And I had developed deep contacts so we knew who we wanted to introduce students to and where we wanted them placed. But to ease them in, we, the first two nights we took them to a, the center of the city, put them in a, a, a family hotel, not, not, a, you know, not, not a, a Hilton, and then walked them around and just talked to them about what they were seeing. You know, some of these people had never been outside of the Midwest, huh? let alone to, you know, Florida or, or Maine. Huh? And I had this one student, he was, he was obviously raised in an upper class home. He happened to be from uh, Michigan. I think his father was a uh, General Motors executive. Nice kid, real nice kid. We were walking in this town and kind of looking around and talking and, and he stopped and he was looking there at an alley. And there was this indigenous woman, and we took them to a part where there were a lot of indigenous people, not just mestizos, but a lot of tribal people, okay? We call them indigenous folks in Mexico. And you know them when you see them. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, not a question. So those are the people who are in a position of um, prejudice huh? and poverty and have been assaulted in economic and cultural ways. I mean, uh, I mean, I even had the experience sometimes of correcting their Spanish. I mean, their first language is not Spanish. It's a native indigenous language. This woman were in, had, had, a, had a child, looked like well, maybe a three-year-old, in an alley, and she was doing what poor women across the world do. Um, uh, she had the child's uh, back against her breast, the legs like this, and he was urinating in the alley. And later we got, and he's shaking his head. We got back, had our group seminar. I said, so what, what, what were you, and he brought this up. What? He said, what kind of a mother would teach a child to urinate in public? I do, I do. That is, that's not, that's not what mothers do. Why? Why would she do that? What, what was going on? And he chewed on that bone for four weeks. And what we tried, what we tried to do with him, I, I think we eventually succeeded. We said, okay, your job now is to find out why she would do that. What, what's going on? Well, she walked 15 miles with a bundle of uh, homemade charcoal on her back to sell to the street people, uh, people making street food with, with charcoal. You see it all over, huh? She knows she'll be chased out of any 
business or restaurant she goes in to use the bathroom, maybe even harmed, huh? she um, has brought a little bundle of uh, pre-chewed food for her child, um, and she has bought him as a treat a sugary drink, which is what poor people do for energy, right? Now he's got to pee. There are public restrooms? <laughs> yeah, right. Don't exist. Uh, worked him through. Why, why would we? That's just a little microcosm, huh? But, but where we wanted him to go was, you, you need before you start making pronouncements in the pulpit about about strategic economic issues <laughs> or political issues, you you need to be able to put on a perspective of what it takes for someone who has been raised to expect the worst and receive the worst to deal with what you call the opportunities open to everybody. You, you following me here? That, that's what we were trying, that's what we were trying to do with him and others. As you, as you began to look at what's going on around you and helping your congregation strategize about these things, you need to be able to apply a perspective that isn't precisely the same as uh, a, a person whose great-great-grandfather immigrated from Norway to Minnesota and who went to a country school and raised his children and her children to understand things the Lutheran way of hard work and uh, I mean, I, I, I was part of that, right? I mean, I, I went for Christmas during seminary with my family in Fargo, North Dakota, and my beloved Norwegian uncle, hard-working guy, fingers like sausages. We sat drinking coffee and eating left son. He said, I, why are these Negroes rioting? What, what is in, why don't they just go out and get a job like me? So, uh, so we're trying to take these seminary students and say, you, that, that, that's what you were taught, and it's not nobody's fault. That's just, that's just how you became a human being. Now, what can we do to raise that perspective to another point? Now, back to visions. Okay. What's the equivalent for us in gaining perspective? Huh? It is, I think the perspective is to put ourselves in a position where we, we learn, we're, we're introduced to perspectives, that are foreign to us, foreign to us. So somebody asked me, well, what do you think about Mexico? I, for 30 years, I lived down there, off and on, sometimes for months. Somebody said, well, how did it change you? I said, well, I think probably if somebody took away my passport and I had to live there, uh, I would be a communist. I, I'd be a dedicated Marxist. I, I would totally, because the only hope I saw amongst the working poor was something like liberation theology, which is essentially a Marxist analysis. And as I saw it, the Marxist analysis is basically correct in Mexico. And I heard, I heard the pink bishop of Mexico stand up and say at Christmas time, this is good news only for the poor. It's bad news for the rich. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, this is, this is our task. If, we're, if we are... If we are thinkers, if we are changers, if we are leaders, then we dare not approach really difficult issues with simply the perspective we, the perspective we inherited. We need a vision, and I'm calling that a perspective that comes from, I don't expect anybody to wake up in the middle of the day. We want Trinity to do this. And if they did, I'd say, check your mental health expert. Okay. <laughs> okay. A any, I, I'm going to pause there. We're going to take a nice, healthy break. Uh, for my benefit as well as yours. But I want to see, I've, I've said a lot of stuff, and maybe we can carry on this during the break, but does anybody have a, a, an urgent question or comment? Uh, Peter kind of sets it out on the Pentecostal sermon when he quotes from uh, Joel. Yes. Just to continue the you know, visions and dreams. Exactly, exactly. Your young men have seen visions, yeah. He, and and that, that speech... I'm not going to show you that text, but thank you for bringing At that speech, it shows Peter starting to get it, but only starting. God's not done with him uh, quite, but thank you for that. Yes? Boy, um, so 
So now questions come to my mind. How much emphasis did Luke put on uh, literary license as a, in, in contrast to... Oh, a total. Total. Right. Yeah, it's a total literary... So, so how, how do we... If, if it wasn't for Mark, then I guess, about the transfiguration... Yeah. Tra tra yeah. If, we, if we didn't have two... two points of reference then, how could we believe what Luke said? Well, what, uh, you, 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 I mean, you just summarized the first lecture series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. This is, in fact, from, uh, as it I... It sounds more like the Fellowship of the Rings. <laughs> well, <laughs> interesting you should mention that because Luke is a, um, is a Hellenistic writer. And by that I mean he knows the Greek literature. So his, his two volumes are a literary masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, and, and there's no question about it. And uh, uh, it, uh, in fact, at a certain point, I'll go ahead and anticipate what I'm saying to you is that actually Peter appears more like uh, a, a hero on a quest. And because it's, it's lengthy and it's episodic and it has its highs and its lows, but it's more like a quest story uh, that is uh, just amazing in its, uh, well, it, it's masterful, to use that word, uh, literarily speaking. And he's got, he's got the equipment for it. Um, and uh, that's because of the things I just pointed out. He's going to, okay, let's step back for a minute. He's going to rewrite Mark's story of a metamorphosis as a Moses epiphany. And he's got the tools to do it. I just counted the numbers. Five of the key Greek words in the Moses story are salted into his revision of the Mark story of the Transfiguration. I mean, that's masterful. And and you don't you don't know it unless you know Exodus. I mean, I mean, you don't see it if you just take it off the page, which is why I'm here, I guess. But I mean, when you begin to see all of the techniques he uses that are, so, that are covert or, or, or simply nuanced, huh? then you don't realize that it is a literary work. But, but remember now, when I say that, he's, he is actually proclaiming a plot in doing this. So that's what to keep your eye on. And, and his plot is that, that change that results in a massive mission that God wants is only the result of being on a journey and experiencing the, the, the unfolding of what God wants in these ways. That's, what's, that's what you'd keep your eye on, not the fact that it's an amazing literary piece. It's the plot. And the plot um, has a lot to teach us, I'm claiming. So before the break, I'll just put this out. When we be, I'll, I'll take your question. When we start talking about church planning, and uh, so forth. And I've been a part of this for a long time, okay, as a pew sitter um, and, and as a, a, a clergy person. What we've been doing, particularly Protestants in this country, is to utilize business models, right? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that that's where we turn. We turn for wisdom to business models. Now, I'm trying to suggest that that Luke would have us put some energy into what I would call a discernment model, which I mean is a searching, a reflecting, a, a communal coming together and saying, isn't it about time we did something? Uh, uh, and I, 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 I had this conversation with somebody and it's just driving me nuts. I want you to think about this with me. It, it's just driving me nuts. Um, that's what I mean when I say uh, that business models, yeah, um, but but there is a there has been emerging for a long time amongst leaders, particularly Protestant leaders. Let's let's start investing some energy in a discernment model, guided by communal reflection and the prompts of the Spirit, and see where that takes us. See 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 if some boldness. 
I mean, my own church um, had a, had for a theme is one quadrennium, holy boldness. Huh? And, and uh, a big TV promotion on, uh, what was it? Open doors, open... Open minds. Open, oh, yeah, open hearts, open minds. Yeah, open doors, open hearts, open minds. So I was this interim pastor in a big city for a short time on emergency. The pastor was yanked for sexual deviation. I go in, and there's this big banner over top, and it's one of these diminishing congregations. And have I told you this story? It, it, okay. And it, it's, uh, I know this city very well. And now it's gradually changed, surrounded by, it, totally Mexican, cotton top congregation, pew filled here, empty here, big powerful church with a big staff 20 years ago. Uh, I'm shaking hands with a woman going out the door under this banner, because I had used a couple of Spanish words in my sermon. She says, well, I, she, I, 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 I think these people should learn English. Uh, I don't know why you're using Spanish. And uh, I'm looking up at this sign, you know, and uh, then I say, well, I said, my mother couldn't, could only speak Norwegian until she went to school. And she went to Lutheran Catechism in the Norwegian language. Uh, she said, oh, yeah, well, she said, when I was a kid, I had to give my Christmas brief both in German and English. <laughs> open hearts, open minds, open doors. <laughs> oh, we had a great business model. We spent millions on a TV, sent out banners, put over churches. Did it change churches? <laughs> uh, you see where I'm going with this? Business model, put a banner up, it'll happen. Maybe? You had a question. Did you have your hand up? Did you have your hand up? Anybody have a hand up? Okay. I st- <coughs> okay. No, the only thing I was going to say is just you know, in terms of, of literature, I mean, literature really does capture truth. You know? Well, um, there you go. Think, Thank you. Know, you. In terms of that's, that, for me, is not a conflict at all because really good literature captures truth in the culture. Well, thank you. And, and these four Gospels are, are not histories. They're not written as histories. Uh, they're, they're proclamations in narrative. And how do we know that? We know that from the end. The, procl- the proclamation is Jesus has died and has risen and offers, uh, off- offers forgiveness from sins. That's a proclamation. And the narrative makes sense of that. So it's a proclamation and narrative. Not intended to be history. And by proclamation, we're also saying claim. Yes. Claim, yeah. a, a claim the truth. Exactly. Yeah. So, and Luke is saying, he's, he, he knows that his whole Mediterranean world, right to Spain, Filled with churches, ninety-eight percent of them are Gentile. He's, huh? I'm, I'm, I meant I said Luke. Yeah, I should say Luke. Luke knows the whole Mediterranean world is filled with Gentile churches. How did this happen? How did God make this happen with these he failed human participants? That that's why the plot makes sense. Is because it he knows it comes out the way it comes out. Now he's going to explain how it comes out. And salted in that are some powerful theological and practical clues for us in declining denominations. I am I I'm being pretty darn hard on you, aren't I? But um, well, oh. no, no, no. You know, I mean, what are we facing as a nation? You know, kind of uh, our African American communities and our Native communities asking us to to examine our own white privilege. I mean, if that's not you know, and, and how tribal we've been. I mean, this is like, no, we're in a crisis, a national crisis with... Well, uh, if, you're, if you're asking, uh, hey, Professor, um, have you walked the walk? Okay, for two years, my wife will tell you, I got tired of dead re- white religion. I went and worshipped in a black congregation of 3,000 people for two years. Only white person there. I wanted to be changed. I wanted to understand. We had 15% black students in my seminary. I wanted to know what their faith was like and what their attitudes were like. And you know, after the f- first two hours, they didn't get up and walk out. <laughs> so if you did, you always raised your hand. <laughs> and I went to Mexico for 30 years and lived with poor people, off and on, off and on. 
changed my heart and mind. Uh, I, I'm just saying, um, you know what? Uh, this is not a real mystery. It's tough. And that's why at the very beginning I pointed out to you, Jesus gets almost killed because people are filled with rage. This is what's going on. And here in this period we have used Esperanza as uh, yep. an occasion to have a yep. to dip our toe. And it's a great program. Or every Sunday to walk with people who great. invite us to start great. to see from another perspective. Or great. once a month to stand out on the street corner and see what that might be like. Uh, or every Saturday morning. Every Saturday morning, what, 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 what? Yeah, what, what happens here? Yeah. Let, let's take a break. Let, let, let's, let's keep talking. Take a good break. Fred! You can count on him for something. Okay. Just a few uh, uh, segue comments about what we've been doing. Uh, is everybody settled? I mean, go ahead, sure. My best friend Bill taught me how to whistle, and I got kicked out of church one day because he taught me in church when I did it. <laughs> came out of my mouth with, and boom. <laughs> that's, that's a great life skill. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, that's there it is, yeah. Um, uh, just a few um, uh, segue comments about this. Uh, I was just had a conversation with Ruth about a program that's been uh, ongoing that um, has a lot of connection with what I've been saying called Compassionate Listening. And um, I, I think I'm talking about that kind of skill and activity as one of these important steps. Uh, Can I do an absolutely. So the last session of this current series on compassionate listening is this coming Monday. It is open to anyone. I will be kind of recapping along with teaching a little bit more new stuff. So we've had a core group, but there's open seats for you. Monday, 630 to 830. Well, that, if, if that had been in existence when I was taking students to Mexico, I, I would have used that as a training uh, because that's the trouble we had was getting people to actually just not keep thinking, well, What's wrong with the way they're doing things? <laughs> uh, which is, of course, the issue. Uh, the other anecdote is that, that when I was uh, director of the Northwest House in Salem, where Red and I had kind of a connection that way, um, Luther Seminary and uh, CDSP were both members of the Ecumenical Institute I was running. And uh, I wanted to teach a course on evangelism which is really kind of unusual for a mainstream church. But it turned out that the, the, the dean at that time at Luther, that was his field. So I had him come to Salem and teach a course on evangelism. And I said, tell me about how you, how you do this. And he said, well, I'll tell you an anecdote. He said, when I was a student in Chicago, um, I, was, I was sent by the bishop to a tiny little south side Chicago Lutheran congregation. And he said, over the years, it was just, it was just, it was totally black. I mean, everything around the church was black. And this was a little, I think it was a, a former German congregation. And um, it was just a, we're down to about eight, ten old Lutherans <laughs> coming in from the suburb. And he, I was a student, he said, he said I'd, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do. Was I there to bury the thing or what? So the only thing I could think of was, he said, I, I decided that we would have some suppers. And I got, uh, we sat with the consistory and said, well, what, um, uh, would it be okay if we, you know, just kind of had a, a simple supper and invited some neighbors in? They said, well, Okay, um, and of course they were very skeptical. Well, he went around and began visiting, got to know some black families and said, you know, would you be willing to just come to the church and sit and have supper? And then to make this story not as long as he was in telling it, 
basically as these older black folks sat having supper with these suspicious white Lutherans of German extraction, the only thing they really had to talk about were grandchildren. And as they talked about grandchildren, these, these lights began to blink. Huh? And, and these old white Lutherans were saying, so the kind of thing you're struggling with, or grand that's like us? And they found a meeting place, a human meeting place. And he said, I'm not bragging or anything, but he said, eventually it became, it became an integrated, small Lutheran congregation, black and white. But he said, I, I didn't know exactly what I was doing. It wasn't a big plan. I didn't, wasn't following. I just, he said, I, said, I just had the idea, maybe we can get people to talk to each other over dinner. And it blossomed. Now that is exactly what I'm talking about in terms of stepping outside and making yourself uncomfortable. And while it's wonderful to do charitable things for people and go to places and do mission trips, that's a little different than recognizing that your population has changed and you're not having conversations of any kind of deep human nature with, with them. And that's tough. That's Tough. That is really tough. And let me tell you why it's tough, because I, 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 I feel this here. Um, you get at a certain stage in life, and some, one of the reasons you go to church is to be ministered to in a way to sing hymns that you recall singing in Sunday school and to hear words and prayers and forms that take you back and give you a sense of connection and comfort. Am I right? That you you got to acknowledge that you have to acknowledge it, huh? uh, and yet and yet you you, it, you you and you know intuitively that if, if you keep doing that, eventually there's going to be anybody else to share a pew with. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. Okay, go to go to handout number five, <clears throat> and our time is, is is doing great. I think we can just do these last three, and come to the conclusion. Since it's the first time I've done it, I wasn't sure how would I... My wife, of course, who's my greatest critic, said, you got too much material. And I said, yeah, I know. Uh, you don't have to use it all. <laughs> well, it's true. I did. I always have too much material. I have too much. I always have too much material. So this is, this is really interesting. Now, mind you, this is Luke 22. Simon now, uh, Peter, has gone uh, through the journey. And, and he has not been the focus as, as often as he is in Matthew, but once or twice he shows up. Not in any way that's definitive. So from the transfiguration scene we just went through till here is a long, long time. So he's in a, he's in a different place now. Let's find out what's going on. Uh, with him. This is really interesting. This is my own translation, so I'll read it. Simon, oh Simon, watch out. Satan himself has demanded permission to work you over the way harvested grain is sifted and blown by the wind, but be warned. However, I have put myself on the line for you by petition for you not to surrender your fidelity, but rather turn right around and become a pillar of strength to your friends in the faith. And then Simon said to Jesus, Master, I am ready and willing to be by your side right into the darkest dungeon or to death should it come to that. And then Jesus said to Simon, Mark these words, Peter, this very day, not tomorrow or the day after or sometime in the future, but this very day before you hear the morning cry of a rooster welcoming the dawn, you will swear up and down that you had never, ever laid eyes on me, let alone explain that you were never a follower. Now, um, let's work through these notes because um, uh, there's some things here that, that are, are, I think, important for the next stage. The first note, uh, this dialogue in its first part is totally unique. The prediction of denial is not unique, of course, but Luke adds the somewhat mysterious dialogue about a deal done 
between Satan and Jesus as it concerns the testimony and trial of Peter. Now, there are translation issues that pivot around the word deo. Uh, and that, that's the word uh, of, um, that is under, that they're in the third line petition. Well, actually, the whole phrase, I have put myself on the line for you by petition. Okay, this is the, this is the issue. This can be taken either as A, a kind of prayer offered by Jesus on behalf of Simon Peter, or B, the actual divine decree that will result in Satan not being allowed to test Peter farther than a certain point. That point would be not only to disavow discipleship, but worse, to not repent after the denial. This would result in a devastating blow to the final revealed mission to Gentiles that is to unfold. I believe it, it, it is the latter. If B is correct, it means that Peter is so vital to the outcome of the mission, Jesus decrees that Satan can have power over him only so far. In various Hebrew texts, Job, Enoch, as well as the New Testament book of Revelation, there are examples of deals made between the divine and corrupted angelic force, giving them certain powers of testing over humans, but with limitations. Luke clearly knows his source as well as is evident in this unique dialogue. This could have been feel, lifted intact right out of Job, the book of Revelation, and other Jewish Christian writings. So, this is really odd, uh, but for plot purposes, uh, Peter is to be taken to the edge, but no farther. Uh, if, if that's also congruent with Jesus' own prayer, and so I want you to look down at point two, because this... This takes place in the um, uh, Gethsemane, Mount of Olives uh, story. Let's just read this. This passage is related both to the giving of the Our Father and the Mount of Olives episodes. In that, Jesus, in that scene, Jesus prays, uh, Your will uh, for me, not, but what you want. And I translate that as, Not according to my wishes, but whatever thou causest to be. As Jesus prepares to enter into prayer on the Mount of Olives, he instructs his disciples, keep on praying so that y'all don't plunge into temptation. Because it is, a, it is instead of Peter, it's, it's a plural you. After he has finished his agonizing prayer session, he returns to find him asleep and says, stand up, y'all, get to praying so that you don't plunge into temptation. So it happens twice. Now, when teaching his disciples how to pray, here's what Luke uh, suggests. Father, may thy name be sacred. May thy reign be made real. Allow us to take bread daily from thy heavenly source. Grant us forgiveness of our sins, even as we promise to pardon er er anyone and everyone who has offended us. And please do not permit that we come under trial. So the theme of trial is prominent in the Lord's Prayer, Luke's, Luke's version, and is found on the lips of Jesus twice on the Mount of Olives narrative. However, the phrase, not according to my wishes, but whatever thou causes to be, is not in the Lord's Prayer, but a part of the prayer Luke places in the mouth of Jesus. So Luke prefers to keep the trial language limited to narrative themes, not part of the Our Father. So what that tells us is, now we, we pray the Matthew version. Huh? Okay, uh, your will be done. That, that, that's, the, that's the version we, we, we pray, okay. But not in Luke, okay. Uh, Luke wants to take that, not my will but your, he wants to put that entirely into the narrative of the temptation and trial of Jesus and relates it to Peter. Hmm? So, Peter is being challenged here to recognize that it's not automatic that he's going to survive the limited trial he's been placed into. It's going to take prayer. Now, how, how does that work? Okay. The thing I didn't tell you about uh, Luke's themes is there's a heavy theme in both the Gospel and in Acts on the role of prayer. Jesus is a prophet and a prayer. Now, at his baptism, only in Luke, okay, when Jesus is standing there, he is in prayer at the time of his, of his baptism. He goes off to pray a lot. 
He's constantly in prayer. And at this moment, when he's about to be killed, he's in prayer. And then tells his disciples to be in prayer. Well, in Acts, when we get into Acts, important things happen when people are in prayer. When Peter is, when, when Cornelius is told to go send for Peter, he's in prayer. When Peter gets the vision that he's to obey the emissaries from Cornelius, he's in prayer. When the Spirit breaks through at the beginning of Acts, they're in prayer. Huh? So this is, this is a, another clue about how the plot works. I mean, it, it, Jesus sets the example. The disciples and apostles are always in prayer. And those who don't even, haven't yet heard about Jesus are in prayer. So how does prayer work? Well, prayer is revelatory. Prayer is not just petition. It leads to understanding. So, you see where I'm going with this. We're looking for clues. How, uh, what, what about, okay, I mentioned to you, bring nudges of the Spirit into communal reflection. You might just want to add as a, as a codicil there. And and weave into that reflection prayer. <laughs> well, let, let, let's, all, let's all pause for a moment and reflect in prayer. If somebody wants to pray, let them do it. Where do you think God is leading us? Or, or, or just anything you want to say in prayer. So that, that's what Luke would say to us. Prayer is not just a matter of paying homage to God, but also in doing that, it's revelatory. It, 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 it leads to understanding, vision. And in the case of the apostles, keeps them from uh, entering into these trials that they're subjected to in a way that destroys uh, the potential that God has for them and for the world. That, that's what's important. Um, let's see, what's point number three? Um, Well, uh, the third line down, the sentence beginning in point number three, the salvation. The salvation enacted by Jesus, a price evident in the prayer scene, is in jeopardy unless and until Peter as leader rejects the temptation to disavow and go back to normal fishing. Only if the disciples persist in their faithfulness will the mission to the entire world be carried out. It is not Enough for Jesus to die for all of humankind's sin. It is only effective when the proxis takes place as the Holy Spirit leads. The only proof of fidelity is demonstrating that the mission is active. Uh, I'm going to read that last sentence again. The only proof of fidelity is demonstrating that the mission is active. So go back up to the translated text. Third line from the top. Not to surrender your fidelity, the Greek word is pieces. That's a really odd thing to say. Because pieces normally means faith. But it can also mean loyalty and persistence in friendship and, um, in this case, uh, fidelity. So that's an odd thing. But it's a, it's a Lucan word. Because in Mark, faith means having courage enough to act in the right way. In, in Luke, fidelity is staying on the journey and not being tempted to turn aside. Sticking with it. So that's why I translated fidelity. So what I want for you, Peter, is don't, don't go to the point where you, you don't repent. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to sin. But don't go to the point where you don't repent and then get back on the fidelity, the fidelity train, the, the track, the, the journey, the way. I think that's a, a remarkable, uh, just those few words, with just those few words, uh, Luke has rewritten this scene uh, to keep Peter alive as the learner who has to be prompted to stay with it. And, and look at the timing. Why, why would it come now? Well, because in the next breath, along comes Judas. <laughs> and what happens after that is, well... I didn't give you a text on it, but 
Um, you, 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 you know well what happened next. And by the way, I probably, I wish, maybe next time if I do this again, I'll, I'll, I'll print this text. Only in Luke, here's what happens. As soon as, soon as the rooster crows and Luke says, I'm telling you, I don't know the guy. Jesus is being, is described by Luke as being transported from the praetorium. And he comes to the courtyard, looks down, and he makes eye contact with Peter. And then, uh, I, I really probably should have given you this text. And then, well, here's what Peter, here's, well, here's what, here's what Luke does. He takes you again into the guts of Peter. Rare. He said, then Peter remembered. So, uh, Peter, Peter is being portrayed as a learner and, and he recalls, and sometimes he recalls incorrectly, sometimes he recalls things he doesn't want to recall, and I'm going to point out later at the very end, he recalls everything correctly. So this idea of memory, ho holy memory, educated memory, episodic learning memory, this is, this is a really significant Lucan idea. So the idea of remembering just keeps coming up in these really important ways. Okay, let's go to the next one, number six. Because this is, this is getting near where finally the mouse trap snaps shut. Oh, just a word about that. I, I, I know I'm being a little bit cute, but it, it is true that it, it's something like a mouse trap because it, the, the cheese being laid up to the trap, it, Peter's following the sensei fishing thing these pieces of cheese, okay? The final piece of cheese comes in this story. He takes the cheese and God's trap slams shut. And then he has to stand up and say, I get it. I get it. Finally, I get it. Um, which is momentous. Um, let's, let's look at it. Now, this is my own translation, so I'll, I'll, I'll read it. There was a certain fellow living in Capernaum, the name of Cornelius, the military commander of a battalion of Roman troops carrying the name the Italians. This fellow was religious and, God, and a God-fearing man, follow, followed in his devotion by his entire household. He was a generous donor to charities benefiting the people and worshipped God ceaselessly in prayer. And one day, while at prayer, about mid-afternoon, he saw in a vision, that's, that's the horama again, an angel of God coming right to him. It said simply, Cornelius. And consequently, he became agitated and fearly, fearful. And Cornelius said, Who are you, Holy One? And the answer came back, Thy petitions and thy generosity, as well as thy devotion, have been recognized by God, and now... Send a trusted man to Joppa and have him locate a person called Simon, a.k.a. Peter. This Simon is right now being offered hospitality by a person also named Simon, a leather worker. He lives by the sea. <clears throat> so immediately after the angel left, Cornelius called two of his household staff and one of his soldiers, who was also a religious person, totally loyal to Cornelius and reliable as well. He gave them a detailed and strict instruction and then sent them to Joppa. And while they were making their way and getting closer and closer to the city, Peter was making his way up to the flat roof of the home where he was a guest, engaged, engaging there in prayer just at noontime. He became famished and needed nourishment, but while a meal was being sent to, sent, set, seen to by his host, he suddenly fell into an out-of-body ecstatic state. And while in this state, he saw something like, a, like seafaring gear, maybe a cloth sail, a sheet, being lowered, let down to Peter's level, held by the corners of the sheet. It was filled with a variety of creepy, crawly creatures and birds, all of them considered not kosher for a practicing Jew. Next thing, this voice said to him, Stand up, Peter. Butcher and eat. But Peter said, 
No way, Holy One. You know I never eat common or condemned food. I only eat kosher. Then the voice came back a second time and said to him, Wrong! If God chooses to make something not condemned, you dare not consider it common. Now this happened over and over again three times. The very same thing. Then suddenly, as if it had never occurred, the sail sheet thing just retracted back up into the blue. And Peter, of course, was very perplexed, was trying to sort out what this dream-like spectacle was all about. And while he was puzzling over this, a group that Cornelius had sent was standing outside the gate of Simon the Leathermaker, calling out and asking if this might be the place where one Simon, a.k.a. Peter, was being given hospitality. At the same moment, while Peter was in the very midst of trying to figure out what the vision had been about, the Spirit said to him, Pay attention. There are three men who are looking for you, so get up, go down, and meet them, and do not repeat, do not hesitate, because it is I who have sent them to find you. Upon descending, Peter confronted the visitors and said, Look, here, here I am the person you've been searching for. What exactly is this all about? And they said, Cornelius, the Roman military commander-in-chief, a righteous and God-fearing man, a person the entire nation of Israel honors and holds in highest esteem, was visited by a holy angel and told to seek you out, and he sent us to bring you back to his household in order to hear the word you bring. Now, go below the double line. The narrative continues. And Now here I'm summarizing. Uh, the three envoys of Cornelius are also hosted by Simon for the night. The next day, Peter accompanies the three envoys back to the house of Cornelius. Upon arriving, Peter is met not only by Cornelius and his household, but by a, by grand, collect, by a grand collection of friends, relatives, and neighbors. He at first regards Peter as, divine, as a divine being and offers homage. Peter abruptly refuses, orders him to stand, and regard him as a fellow mortal, be, mortal being. Peter then says to the assembled body, Y'all, Gentiles, all of you, know full well that it is an abomination for a Jewish person to share in common with a Gentile. In fact, it is even forbidden to enter a pagan dwelling. However, God has instructed me to not consider any person common or condemned. For his part, Cornelius then briefly describes what happened in his vision, and that ended up with Peter being asked to come. Following this, Peter begins his epic sermon to a barbarian congregation, saying, to tell the absolute truth, that word that is the word in the Greek text, it has been made clear to me that God does not recognize anyone to be special. God does not make distinctions Everyone is the same in God's eyes. The sermon is then a summary of the elements of Jesus' life, ending with the meaning of his death and resurrection, that is, forgiveness of sins. To Peter's amazement, the Gentile audience experiences Pentecost, this time a Gentile Pentecost. They are filled with the Spirit. Peter acknowledges that he has no choice in the light of this than baptism by water for all. The Jewish believers with Peter are bewildered by these things, and in the retelling of the story in Acts 11, these persons are more closely identified. Now, there you have it. There you have it. Uh, some details. Okay. The way uh, just turns up, this is about visions, about prayer, and about being in the way. All three are just totally saturated in this story. We start to see now a tendency from now on in Acts of massive repetition. So Cornelius, I didn't translate because Cornelius just tells the story. And we did it a second time. And then Peter tells the story. And then we're going to see in the last handout, Peter retells the story again to the assembled Jewish population of believers. So what's going on here is that, that Luke belabors. He, he takes you step. Why, why all this detail? What time of the day? Why, why is the house of the person providing hospitality called a, a leather worker? Why, why, a, a tanner? Why, why? 
he's taking you, this builds credibility. As you know, if, 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 if a, a, for recreational reading, a, a, a fiction, a novel, if, if someone wants to lead you on a path, they take you on that path step by step by step until finally you, you, have, you have suspended, as they say, your incredulity. <laughs> you have suspended your criticism and followed that author to the point where when the point is made, you're willing to accept it. So that's the reason for the details. So you have no doubts about what happened. It's a flat roof, describes the animals, and when I say, sometimes this gets translated as sheet. Well, as you know, in, in sailing, a sail is called a sheet, right? And, and actually the word has some echoes of sail making. Uh, it doesn't come out in the NRSV. So it's, it's like, like a sail. Huh? And you got all these unforbidden animals poking out you know, and they're just they're just hinted at they aren't described in any great detail because you know and then when he retells the story in chapter 11 it's a different description he, he, he just varies a few little things but takes you step by step by step so that we see Peter's mind now what's interesting here is when when Peter talks back to God Anybody who's been following the plot understands that, that memory is at work because it's a replication of the fishing story. No, I'm not going to go out and fish. I just have been out there. We worked our tails off. There are no fish. Don't you get it? No, I'm not going to eat those animals. Don't you get it? I am a good practicing Jew. I don't eat unkosher food, don't you get, you see the memory thing? Is it work? And so, now, Peter, Luke wants us to, to expand the story, fill some gaps. Now, Peter, we, we, we can look inside Peter and say, ah, he, oh, hmm, he knows better, huh? When the voice comes and says, uh-uh, no, you got this wrong. We believe he's willing to accept the change. We believe it. See, I mean, not just because the author says it, because it's written in such a way that makes us believe it. Huh? Now, it's important we believe it because now a haul of fish is not at stake. It's the whole Gentile mission that's at stake. And if he doesn't recall it, if he's not a learner, who can go back to those experiences, reflect on them, and learn from them, and learn that openness is the clue to falling in line with the way. If he doesn't do that, all is lost. All is lost. Yeah. Be interesting. The sheet, which would yeah. be familiar to Peter as a fisherman, and the houses near the sea. How many of those would have been creatures that he's passed by his whole life, not eating? Yeah, and, and uh, not only that, um, the, um, <laughs> what's well known about this and comes up actually in, in Matthew's version of a parable um, is he also has eliminated in his work as a fisherman. Mm -hmm. uh, well, shellfish. Yeah, any snails or lampreys. or I mean, I mean she, he, he's used to sorting things out. He, he's, he knows how to sort things out because he's got experience. And what he's told is stop sorting things out. Don't do it. Uh, and so he's, and the voice then goes on and says, now, and I translate, I do, I do kind of emphasize it with, a, with an extra phrase. Um, I say, don't you dare. The voice in Greek is very clear. Don't even hesitate. Meet them and say yes. <laughs> and, and he does. Now, some other points to note that I think are important here. Uh, um, our time's fine. Uh, Peter doesn't decide to baptize him because he got a positive response or repentance. It's very carefully written. That's, that's not what happens. 
He has to baptize them because he experienced the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. And seeing them receive the Holy Spirit, he can't fight it. That He can't fight it. I don't know if you ever saw that before. It, 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 it's not, you, you could rewrite this story. And, and, uh, and the assembly, listening to this sermon, cried out and said, oh, save us, and they actually do. And then Peter says to himself, well, I guess if they've accepted the gospel, that's not what happens. He baptizes them causatively because there's been an outpouring of the Spirit. He can't fight it. He can't fight the Spirit. So now uh, he makes this, this really interesting statement, and it's going to come up in the next one, uh, the, the final handout. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the distinction thing. Um, this word I have in Greek, count up from the very bottom, one, two, three, four, five lines. It's in square brackets. It looks like something like pi, and then it looks like a P, but it's an R. Prosopo, that's, that starts out to look like prosopon, face. Now I want to tell you something about this word. The only place this word is ever used is here ever, except in some later Christian writing that picked it up here. This is an invented word. The, on the page, count up one, two, three, four, five, six lines, square brackets. There's a, there's a bunch of Greek with a word that starts with something that looks like pi, right? Something that looks like a, like a, like a P but it's really an R. And the next one's O, and the next one's an S, pros, and then a, a long O, proso. That looks like it's starting to be face. The word is invented. So it has, it has uh, that just tells you what Luke is, uh, thinks of this word. The, the only meaning that you can get out of it in terms of other words that are related, and, there, and there's a lot, is, is the idea of partiality. And, and the, the reason it looks like prosopon, it, it's based in something like this. I recognize that face and that face and that face, not that face. I, that, that face I recognize, that one I don't recognize. So it's a very strong statement. Peter, what, what Luke puts in Peter's mouth is, I've rediscovered the nature of God in a way I didn't understand before. And so he's making a theological statement about God. Don't, don't, and, and so what, what about God is most important in this discovery? It is that God makes no distinction. Now that's incredible. Not, not that he's everywhere or knows everything or as in Paul, uh, understands everybody to be under the rule of sin. <laughs> huh? Not that. The only thing that's important about God to know right now is that He that God shows no partiality, that God is impartial. Wow. Is that big or what? Doesn't, doesn't Matthew kind of do the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount where he says God sends His rain on yep. the dust? Yes, he does. He does. He does. It's, it's he does, he does, uh, but, but it's not a theological statement. I mean, in Matthew, uh, in Matthew, Jesus never says uh, God is, um, does not distinguish between people. But at the very end, at the Great Commission, uh, he recognizes that the, the good news is for all people, which is a missional statement. I'm talking about a pure theological statement. Peter says, I got to tell you, and by the way, this is before the sermon. So it is, remember the V8 ads? It is exactly a dope slap. He's standing there and he's, he's surrounded by these people. He's looking back on everything. These things that have happened, his memories at work. And he, he does this thing and he says, okay, so I, I, folks, Gentile folks, I get it. Now I get it. God shows no partiality. So here's the good news. And then he does... The sermon is essentially an outline of Mark. 
you heard about uh, Jesus of Nazareth uh, who went about doing good, healing all the rest of the devil, and, and then he, he, we crucified him and he rose from the dead. I mean, it's, just, it's basically a, a gospel summary, a sermon. So we know what the sermon is that he preached, huh? uh, which I think is um, also really interesting. Now, I got another hood. What is this? Um, oh, um, yeah, go, go up. I, I think I would change this translation. Um, I want to talk about this. Um, uh, where he where he says, well, un, under the under the double lines, count down one, two, three, four, five, with the italicized stuff that begins y'all, y'all Gentiles, all of you. And by the way, my wife is making notes of typos that I'll go back this afternoon and correct and give you a fresh sheet that's... We thought we caught them all, but I, I've never done this stuff before, so there's going to be a couple typos. Um, you all, Gentiles, all of you, know full well that it is an abomination for a Jewish person to share in common with a Gentile. In fact, it is even forbidden to enter a pagan dwelling. Now that word abomination, uh, I, I, I may... I want to change that to uh, just simply uh, unlawful. Um, I, I do get the idea of law in to, with the word forbidden, but that word actually comes up quite um, rarely, uh, only here and once in First Peter. Uh, but it definitely it, is one of these words with an A in front of it, like moral, amoral, and it, it, it definitely is... Uh, n not kosher or not to be done. So it is maybe even more right and unlawful. So now the reason that I'm pausing on that point and being self-critical about my translation is this. Look, look at what Peter's being asked to do. Uh, he is being asked to throw Torah to the winds on that point. Now I, I I let that let's let that work for a minute, okay? I mean, he's giving he's telling he's confessing to them. You know what I'm when I'm going against everything I've thought. You know what this takes for me to say. I, I that that everything I've been taught that's right and what's wrong. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm doing, by just by being here, I'm doing something unlawful. I'm denying my Jewish heritage right now, in this moment. You, you get that, folks? And then he goes on to say, but, but, God has made me to understand that I'm not to call you condemned or common and thereby bar me from even talking to you or sitting down and having a sandwich with you. I'm not, not only that, I have been taught that God doesn't recognize those differences. Wow. Does that give us permission to do the same thing in other aspects of our faith? I, you know, I, I'm saying Luke, Luke's, Luke's got an agenda. So to apply it universally, I, I'd be I'd be cautious, okay, uh, uh, but I'm just saying that. Here's what I would say. What, here's what I've discovered in my going into other cultures and supervising students for, I'm I'm talking, forty years now, okay. I have learned that that the attitudinal change necessary for people to accept as their mission something. Has, has meant giving up something dear and precious and even holy. Okay. I'll tell you a little story. A, a dean of a Catholic seminary for eight years, I went to Mass every day. Uh, my second child was baptized in the seminary chapel. I never communed once in eight years. However, 
I, I, I got to know, because of my work, I got to know uh, quite a few of what I would call tough-minded, God-to-hell nuns. And one nun was sitting beside me in chapel once. She went up to take communion. I was kneeling there. She came back and she did this. <laughs> here's here's the host. I, that, that's that's against the law. Now, what what brought her to the point? She knew I'd been sitting at mass for years, never communing once. She's this nun comes in to supervise students, but she's out working in public housing. With the poor, you see what I'm saying? She's been brought to a point where she's willing to break the law to give me communion. That, that, that's the way I'd answer that question. Was she right in doing so? By what what did I do? Uh, I refused it. Yeah, yeah. I, I could not put her in that position. I refused it. But my heart, but I cried. I cried. I said, I had to stay in chapel for her. I, I just cried. She stood there pat me on the back. <laughs> you worked in Taiwan in the mission field, and we said that if you get far enough away from Rome and far enough away from St. Louis and Minneapolis, it's surprising what you can do. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for instance, in the African mission, um, you got this, 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 Native talent leader who's got three wives. You got to baptize him and make him a catechist but without making them get rid of two of the wives? Well, if Philadelphia or New York or London doesn't know about it, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> that's why I'm answering the question that way. Yeah. I think that's there to say you may be challenged by what you have been under in order to respond to the, the way God is leading you that's undeniable. But I think that, I would, I would say that's got to be in the process of communal reflection and prayer. Yep. I would also go back to what we've been looking at, the statement of faith, uh, the draft document for women and justice, and looking at how interpretations were in the past on, you know, women shouldn't be leading, women shouldn't be preaching, women shouldn't be whatever, and where we've grown from that and where we haven't grown, where we're still not able to lift up women voices, lift up indigenous women voices, and, and go beyond just saying, well, okay, you're okay, but that next step of not only maybe not putting them down, but walking beside them in advocacy. And that's that, that whole next piece, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Walking beside them in advocacy. Well, that makes sense to me. Well, I think this, this stuff is, and by the way, none, none of this is accidental. I mean, that, that's why Luke, Luke is writing this to make you say, wait a minute. And by the way, that issue, I mean, just, just to show you how, how tough that issue is, in Galatians, uh, Paul calls Peter a hypocritical leader because he caught him not eating with Gentiles when some of the conservative Jewish Christians from Jerusalem show up. So, so you, you see the point. I mean, well, no, I mean, in, in, in Galatians, Paul accuses Peter of being a hypocrite. Yeah, 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 I mean that. that so that I mean, just reinforces that he's alerted. Abs absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, it just goes to show you that uh, again, this this path of change is hazardous. So would you accept that uh, thinking about again about checking your cultural convictions at the door? Yeah. That it is that it is a reinterpretation of the law or a willingness to yeah. say that the way I've always understood and appropriated or thought about or practiced the law is now, I now understand it in a new or in new light, in a new yeah, way. Yeah, 
and, and that which is uh, from a new perspective. Yes, and, and in Luke 24, uh, I mean, Acts 24, that's what Paul says in front of Peter. He says, listen, he said, I, I, I am in complete compliance with Moses and the prophets. I act, act completely lawfully. Well, we all know he doesn't in the interpretation of some, but in his mind, he is a, he is a loyal uh, Jew. He didn't, become, he didn't become something different. He's a Jew. And he, he says, I, I, now I understand Moses and Elijah differently, but I'm in complete compliance. So you're right. How that becomes reinterpreted, what does that mean? Yes. You threw in, in answer to my question, you threw in something. I had a similar situation that happened to me. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite as traumatic as far as who was involved. But I took it as, hey, they're coming around. Rather than taking mm -hmm. on what you did, mm -hmm. how much it cost them. Yes. Yeah. I think I think you don't want to forget the cost factor. I mean, it, it you have you have to, and, and Luke is accurate in, in doing. It. Well, let's look at number seven. I think we got we got time for this. Now, the the the, the title of this is "Head Hefe's Harassed Poor Peter." Forgive me, I'm being a little, <laughs> I'm being a little cute. I know, but but it's true. So Peter has this experience. Now now comes the communal part, because he goes back, and. The text, look at the NRSV text. Look at verse 2, second line. So when Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcisers, believers, criticized him. Why would you do this? So then Peter explains it to them step by step, and then he tells the story. And it goes from verse 5 until verse 15. That's the retelling of the story. Then at 15 it picks up. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had upon us at the beginning. We were made equal by Pentecost experiences. And I remembered, there we go, that's the word. I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And there I have the Greek. It's, it's interesting. I want you to go down to point number two, if we cover nothing else, I want to, this gives us a glimpse into the mind of Peter, a rare peek into the inner workings of the change of heart and mind. God has snapped shut and trapped Peter in the mousetrap. It is as if Peter says, and this is my, my paraphrase of what might be going on in his head, back then as I concluded my sermon to all those Gentile folks, there was a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Right at that moment, I put together what was happening before my very eyes and the prophecy that Jesus gave us as he was leaving. He said the Holy Spirit would be our baptism, not just water baptism. My memory came, came like a lightning bolt of, of insight and hit both my head and my heart. I was being asked to change everything I thought I knew about Gentiles. Wow! He really meant it when he said, Resist it, repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed to all nations. So look how his memory is working. It, 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 he's recalling. So I would say the mousetrap is the prophecy. At that moment, the prophecy is fulfilled. And he, in order for it to be fulfilled, he had to put all this together in his own mind. Now, um, go down to three. I want to retranslate something. Uh, that is the NRSV, who, who was I that I could hinder God? That's a really odd sentence. It starts with the, uh, the pronoun I, ego. Then we have a verb, I, uh, with an active verb. And then the word powerful, and then stand in the way of, and then God. So I would translate something like this. Who indeed could I have thought myself to have been were I to have found the strength to thwart God? That's a theological statement. By the way, it kind of echoes Luther. <laughs> right? He's saying, when I saw all this, in spite of my instincts to say, no, 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 who was I? Who was I to have said, God, you're wrong. This is wrong. 
this is phony. I'm not going to be a walk away from it. Well, which is the 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 the, the move away from the behavior in the boat? Yes. Or on the rooftop? Yes, exactly right. The, the boat, the rooftop, uh, the 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 temptation scene, uh, the denial. All of that is plotting the career of a learner who's watching a prophecy unfold and by participating in it and learning how to respond. So, where did I, where did I begin? The whole thing, the three points. Uh, check your enculturated convictions at the door. Peter had to. Experience the other in a place where doubts about number one are made to stand in question. Peter's experience at the house of Cornelius. Experience the Spirit's nudges in a communal context of reflection. We didn't finish all that chapter 11 stuff, but the way it ends up is, well, let me look at it. Let's look at the text. Here's how it ends up. Um, number seven. It, it's remarkable. Uh, look one, two, three, four lines from the bottom on the NRC translation, and they praise God saying, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. And it's de-repentance, not, not repentance. So, look what happened. In communal reflection, they say, having he heard this story, we have to agree. We have been given the gift of telling the Gentiles they're a part of, of this good news. Huh? Pretty remarkable stuff. Questions? Responses? Seems to me, and this is just off the top of my head, that we approach our scriptural study in looking for the historical Jesus, in uh -huh. looking for the cultural uh, background in which the thing is written, and it seems to me that, that you're kind of giving us another way in which we look as to how we would live that ourselves and how we bring forth well, it gives us some freedom, like I asked earlier. It yeah. gives us freedom to repeat. I, 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 it gives us freedom to retranslate. That's a very helpful comment. What, what, what I'm saying to you is that um, as Protestants, we claim that Scripture is authoritative. So what I guess I'm saying is that when we find ourselves in the midst of wonderment about our future and what we should be doing and how we should be changing, if we should change, uh, we have an obligation to pay attention to Scripture. Uh, and I'm saying that, that, that Luke's, Luke's whole development, uh, and I'm looking at obviously from a literary, theological point of view, that whole development is particularly relevant because it deals with the dy same dynamics that we confront. Okay? Because we know that and we're particularly here in you know Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Vancouver, Portland, uh, we, we know that we're surrounded by a changing population. Uh, I, I don't see them in our pews, right? Yeah. To be real honest with you. So uh, what I'm saying is it's relevant because the, the same wonderment is confronting us. What is it that God might be saying to us about what kind of change might be needed in order for us to not consider the others the others, but an, an aspect of our mission and our life. Am I being too blunt here? I mean, I would hope... Not yet. <laughs> I think the secondary question that goes with that is how do you envision something you don't know? Exactly. And, 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 and it comes back to the point where, where Luke is helpful. It's a journey, not a moment. It's a process of putting yourself in a place where you have to confront some things that are uncomfortable. You put yourself in a position of reflective prayer communally, saying, what does this all mean? I had this experience. I'm trying to figure this out. Mm -hmm. I mean, in other words, you're right. And, and, and then t up front to say, listen, this is not going to be comfortable. Th this is going this is gonna hurt. Some of this is going to hurt. Okay. Now, let me give just a practical thing. Okay. And I'm not talking about any particular case, but I could. Okay, in the last 20 years, 
Okay, and this happened in my family, but I won't tell you who. In the last 20 years, we have had a, a revolution of what happens inside families when somebody comes out as gay. And what has happened again and again and again and again is that because we hold that person so dear, we, instead of shutting the door, do compassionate listening. And then we discover somehow qualities and goodness that leave us with a sense of awe in their gayness. I mean, I have a lesbian Norwegian cousin. And uh, I, I come from a huge Norwegian family here. She and her partner are our preferred vacation conversation. They're the sweetest, most wonderful couple to be with of all of the couples in my extended family. Now, it's probably because they're both sweet people anyway. But together, we use their condo, they use our condo, we have dinner together. I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, um, I mean... There you go. There you go. That, that's, that's exactly my point. Is the, uh, we, we just, it's like this Lutheran dean in this little dying Lutheran congregation said, let's have dinner together. All of a sudden, do your grandchildren do the same thing? Do they do the same thing? They roll their eyes when I ask them about, yeah, they, yeah I don't know. It's a, they, we don't talk the same. Yeah, what are we going to do? I'm afraid for them. Well, you have that conversation. The white grandpa and the black grandpa say, I guess there's not a whole lot of difference between us. Now, I mean, I'm being somewhat elementary here in my illustration, but I'm just saying Luke's whole plan is convincing because it resonates w with how we have experienced life. We validate it because... Peter is us. I, I think I might want to end there. I think I, and, and, I think, and I thank God every day for the mistakes that they've recorded. You know, yes. That, yes. That it's not a perfect thought. Yeah. And, I, and, and let me tell you, I have heard the, the cock crow. I was traveling with my father. On the train back in, 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 in the 50s, back, back to Canada, because we are Canadian, and all these black porters, and I heard my father give an order to a, to a porter and call him George. I said, Dad, how, how did you know his name? He said, well, they're all named George. <laughs> the cock crow. <laughs> oh, oh, really, Dad? Okay, I'll just keep calling him George. So, <laughs> I mean, it's a small story, but, yeah. you know. But, the, but the, the, the comment about how do you do this, you have said today that one puts themselves in a position to uh, reinterpret one's understanding yeah. of the law of obedience, of obedience by being in a place, by be practicing a prayerfulness, which allows for revelation by engaging with and walking with what, whoever we would call the other. Okay, you want me to go a step further? Yeah. I, 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 I will give you a concrete example of how this would work. Okay. But am I on the... You're, you're, not only are you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to springboard on it. You would, living where you live, huh? engineer conversations with those others in a setting that is comfortable. And then you from Trinity in your whiteness and Lutheranness would come apart and talk, what, what was your experience? How did you experience that? What, 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 let, can we, let's pray about that and see if that goes anywhere. <coughs> see if that's taking us anywhere. That, that's what I'm saying. We might go visit the mosque uh, at Dar al I, yeah. I, I, I don't want to be Rick Steves, but I, 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 what I did in my career in terms of taking students to force them to live and talk with poor families in Mexico, okay, or, or Indians, or, or in, in Hopi, or, or what. All of that was about, you have to have a human encounter that's real and, and has some sustaining quality to it. 
like an hour or two over a meal or walking with them to work or to school. I don't mean just visiting or, or, or sending them a basket. Or you know, I'm saying if you want me to be concrete about a program, it would be that plus coming together later and talking about that and, and then praying about it. Persevering and praying. And see if there are nudges that need to be brought into communal reflection about what change that might need. I don't know how I could be more programmatic. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm edging on meddling here. But it's not that we haven't done. I mean, we had you know this big meal with the, our, our Muslim women community, and we sat down at a table together, and we talked about parenting our uh, young adult children, <coughs> and you know, kind of how they did it in their culture, and, there you and go. what I was struggling with, with you know, our, uh, having adult sons still live with me. And um, you know how they set limits, and what things they set limits. I mean, it was just—it was like so helpful. And and you came away thinking about Muslims how? Uh, Muslim mothers uh, struggling with raising their their children, just you know, and having to as you struggle, as well as I struggle. And they don't have to be the same struggles. In fact, you're. you're because your struggles are different, because the culture is different, but yeah. you're struggling together, and you're both mothers. Yeah. There you go. That, that's it. So uh, here's the problem. Go back to the church uh, that I was the um, interim at. Open hearts, open minds, open doors. Yeah, but they ought to learn how to speak my language first. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can have all the Sunday school lessons you want, have all the banners you want, have all the TV ads, all the little posters up. Uh, it, will it change hearts and minds to the point where enough change enables us to become a different congregation in the future that's vibrant but different? That, that, that's, let me, unfortunately, this is probably the 80-year-old retired guy ordained more than 50 years ago, okay, saying, it makes me sad. I'm walking into Church of Canada, Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopal, Lutheran churches all over the place. And it's cotton tops who don't want to change and the churches are dying. And I'm sorry, it, it just absolutely makes me weep. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And church leaders, universities, this is, this is not my wisdom. All of us, we get together and talk about it. It's all about how do we get attitude to change to the extent that we become open and inviting to the other. That, that, that's all it's about. Everything, from, everything beyond that is mechanics. Commonplace mechanics. What time should Sunday school be? Uh, that, that, that's my... That's my passion because it's, it's, it's my sorrow. Huh? I mean, I'll tell you, when I went to seminary in Chicago, 1960, I got up the first morning in August to go to church. This was in a, a county seat town where my wife went to college. Seminary shared the campus. I stood, I got close to, to the downtown. I stood there in awe. This kid from Pacific Northwest. My mouth was going like this. There were police ba barricades. I, said, well, I asked the cop, what, is there an act? No, no, he said, we're directing traffic in the church. Hundreds! Catholic church, Lutheran church, Methodist church, Crescent church, Congregational church, all in the same square. Hundreds of people flowing to church, 1960. Huh. Not today. No, but we were tribes back then. We were, we were very tribal. Um, That's my point. That's my point. I mean, you go from that to today, clearly, uh, I had another lecture on sociology of why we're declining and why we did well back then. I won't give it, but we knew what to do with the population we had and the attitudes we had back then. They don't work today. So why should our churches still be tribal when our society right. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, not, 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 not to be political, but in the, mac, in the macrocosm, the happiness of our country is the same issue. In my mind, some of the word accept 
tolerance of the other, tolerance of the other. Too weak. And, yeah. I want to, I mean, I've been sitting here thinking, why aren't we talking more about actually exercising the love that we talk yeah. about? Yeah, tolerance is too weak. That, that's not what it's about. Yes, oh, or, or, I, I, I totally agree. Or, or pity. Or, right. Yeah, it's, and it goes to the white people that are addicts. It goes to the white people. And this should not be about white guilt. This is not right. about white guilt. Right. Don't, don't cop out by talking about, oh, we're all guilty white people. No. Oh, we help people. You know, no, no, forget about that. That won't oh, we're work. We're ready for the next one. I'll go back and make some of these corrections and give you a fresh uh, bundle. I'd like to 